Yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, very good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, good morning to you if you're on the East Coast or anywhere in between. So nice to see you. My name is Ghassan Abu Alfa. I'm from Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center. Um, greatly honored and delighted to uh, be part of a wonderful team today from the McLever Foundation to uh, welcome you all to this important conference. Uh, I say it's important. We have done that before and we know very well. Thanks to all of you for joining us about all the valuable information that we're going to go over. It's going to be quite a bit of info that's going to come from all experts. And there's many of us who are really going to join today to give the important views and the perspectives that are needed for taking care of our dear patients and loved ones with liver cancer. With this said, I'm going to be uh, passing on to uh, I, Ivory Allison from the American Liver Foundation to welcome you as well. Thanks so much for joining. And Ivory, the floor is yours. Welcome, everyone. We'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules today. This program is being delivered on the Zoom webinar platform and will be recorded. During today's presentations, if you have a question or comment, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on the chat feature. We will make every effort to ask all questions during the Q&A portion of the program. Again, please note that this program is being recorded and will be available on ALS YouTube channel for future viewing. American Liver Foundation was founded over 46 years ago and is the nation's largest patient advocacy organization for individuals with liver disease. Each year, we engage over 5 million people through our robust education, support, and awareness initiatives. As part of our commitment to the liver community, ALS offers a range of educational programs for patients. Our mission is to promote education, support, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. I'd like to personally thank our planning committee for such a phenomenal job. You just heard from Dr. Abu Alpha, Dr. Esrin, Dr. Guy, Dr. Taddy, and Dr. Zarampar for curating this conference and doing a remarkable job. Thank you again. And a special thank you to our speakers today. We could not do this without them. And I look forward to hearing from all of you over the next two days. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors for their dedication, commitment, and support of this program. Our presenting sponsor, Exelixis, premier sponsors, Esai and Genetech, clinical trial sponsor, Eureka Therapeutics, and our partner, Bristol Myers Squibb. Now we will hear from our presenting sponsor. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem. Hopefully the solution that problem may lead to a drug. From everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do, but Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front in good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market? Thank you again to our sponsors. I would now like to introduce our first presenter, 
Dr. Patty. She is a professor of medicine, vice chief of faculty development, and associate program director of the medical scientist training program at Yale School of Medicine. She directs the liver cancer program at VA Connecticut Healthcare System and oversees a VA regional tumor board. Welcome, Dr. Taddy. Thanks so much, Ivory, for the introduction. So I'm here really to give you a primer. So my topic is liver cancer 101. And what you're gonna hear is sort of in broad brush strokes, um, how we approach liver cancer. And then the subsequent speakers are actually gonna break it down a little bit more. Um, the reason that I didn't prepare slides is because I think that it's very hard sometimes to assimilate a lot of information when it's coming at you from many different sources. And really the intent of this conference is to, you know, really try to explain things in a way that you're empowered to ask questions, to pick our brains, to really feel like the most valuable player on the team, which is what you are. So we're going to talk about liver cancer. And I think it's important to know that there have been tremendous developments in liver cancer in the last 10 years, such that we now have many more therapies available for patients with liver cancer. And we really are getting a, a sort of flavor for how to handle this, this cancer in a very highly individualized way so that liver cancer is a latecomer to precision medicine. But what we really wanna do is have each patient be the center of their own team that comes up with the best plan for them, okay? So let's talk a little bit about why liver cancer is challenging. It's challenging because more often than not, actually really in about 90% of cases, liver cancer arises in a patient who already has chronic liver disease. And so essentially you're trying to treat two diseases or two problems. One is the chronic liver disease, and then the other is the development of a cancer in that chronically inflamed or scarred liver. And that actually makes some limitations on how we approach this cancer because the organ itself is damaged and we need to be sure that we allow you to have as much good liver function as possible to handle the therapies for the liver cancer. So we essentially have one patient with two distinct diseases and we know that cirrhosis or scarring of the liver leads to a fertile ground for cancer to grow, but oftentimes multiple cancers. So it's not just one spot of cancer, it may be multiple or recurrences over time. So it is a chronic thing that needs to be followed very carefully from the moment of diagnosis of liver cancer. And we know that cirrhosis does complicate not only how we consider treatment, but also how we design clinical trials to really determine the best treatments in the future. Uh, liver cancer is an unusual cancer. It's the only solid organ tumor that can be diagnosed by imaging alone, meaning not everybody is offered a biopsy. Um, and there's some consequence to that in the sense that um, we're able to make a very definitive diagnosis with imaging in the right patient, a patient with cirrhosis, but without a biopsy, sometimes we're not exactly sure um, sort of what could be the best treatments in the future. So right now we don't have tumor profiling available for liver cancer that allows us to really determine the best possible course of therapy, but that's not to say we may not in the future. There are certain types of liver cancer, cholangiocarcinoma, for example, that tumor profiling does help determine treatment course. I'm really focusing my talk on hepatocellular carcinoma or the cancer that arises from the liver cells, not from the bile cells. The other issue that makes liver cancer a very unique cancer is that it's also the only solid organ malignancy for which liver transplantation offers a durable cure and a different sort of cure than the type of cure that most oncologists look for. So most oncologists are very happy when they can achieve you know, a five-year survival that's pretty high, whereas in transplant, you're really looking for five-year survivals that are, you know, in excess of, you know, 80, 90 percent. And so there's a difference in the calculus of, of survival for that particular treatment. Um, and so it's a very important conversation to have. And really, if we can detect liver cancer early, when it is transplantable, then we can actually afford a decades-long cure from the cancer, but we're also removing the sick organ, the, the organ with the scarring and the inflammation of cirrhosis, 
and really giving that person, you know, a, a healthy liver and one that won't be prone to developing cancer. So where at all possible, that is something we really ought to strive for. But many, many patients are diagnosed and they are not transplant candidates or their cancer may be too far along to consider transplantation. And by no means are they without options. In fact, they have plenty of options. So in terms of liver cancer, we have to think a lot about the epidemiology or where exactly do people um, live who get liver cancer and what are their underlying liver diseases? And that epidemiology is changing. Um, so in the past, a lot of people in the United States had hepatitis C, that was the cause of their cirrhosis and their liver cancer. We've been able to treat hepatitis C. It's very important to get hepatitis C treated because you're actually eliminating the virus and eliminating the risk factor for cancer. If you have cirrhosis, even with hepatitis C, you should still get your hepatitis C treated because it reduces your risk of cancer. So hepatitis C has changed in terms of the natural history of what we're seeing. We're seeing fewer liver cancers in uh, patients who've had hepatitis C and been cured, uh, but still they remain at risk if they have significant scarring. So it's very important for you to know where you stand in that um, spectrum of having scar or not prior to your hepatitis C therapy. But we're seeing more and more apart from hepatitis C, which is on the decline because we can treat it and cure it, fatty liver disease leading to inflammation and scarring and cirrhosis. And fatty liver disease is important because it has a different course. It has a different natural history and one that we're just beginning to understand, but it also carries a risk of cirrhosis and liver cancer. So I want you to be getting the feeling of, of the fact that cirrhosis is usually um, sort of where you have to be before you develop a liver cancer. Um, that's not always the case. The other group that's very important to remember is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B can actually give rise to liver cancer in the absence of cirrhosis. And so we need to be vigilant in, in patients with hepatitis B. So, so this epidemiology is shifting. The other very important etiology for liver disease that often is not discussed is alcohol. Alcohol-related liver disease is probably the most prevalent cause of liver disease in the world. Um, and alcohol, um, once it uh, damages the liver to the point of developing cirrhosis, those patients too are at risk of developing liver cancer. And so these different underlying causes of liver disease, um, once the person develops cirrhosis, they can all develop liver cancer, which is why anybody with cirrhosis should be in a surveillance program for liver cancer. And Dr. Guy is going to give you a lot more um, sort of education on who to screen, essentially everyone with cirrhosis and also those patients who have hepatitis B who may go on to develop liver cancer without developing cirrhosis first. So that surveillance is very important. If you have cirrhosis, you should be undergoing ultrasound screening every six months. Um, and there are people for whom ultrasound may not be sensitive enough. And there are other recommendations in those people for what we call dynamic imaging, like a CT scan or MRI. Uh, and that's done with contrast, very sensitive. That's more of a diagnostic test than a screening test, which is why ultrasound is used as a screen because it's cost effective. Um, once we have a mass noted on ultrasound, that's actually when we move to a diagnostic test. And that diagnostic test is CT or MRI. It's a specialty protocol test to really make sure that we're looking at your liver with the most sensitive possible way. And we have very good um, ways of reading those exams that give us an index of suspicion of whether this mass is something simply to watch or something that may become a liver cancer or already is a liver cancer. And so those kinds of questions are important to ask your doctor if they say, oh, we found something on your ultrasound. Well, what's next? It's probably gonna be a CT or an MRI. After that, they'll come back and let you know the results. And you wanna say, you know, what, what type of mass is this? You know, do I need to be concerned? What's my follow-up? Because every way that we characterize these things that we see on CT or MRI gives us an idea of how, how frequently you need to come back for imaging. So that always should be a question. When do I need to come back, okay? Once we have a bona fide cancer, which we can detect by imaging, then we 
either say it's a cancer because it meets all the classifications by imaging, or we may be concerned that it may not, in which case you will be asked to have a biopsy. And a biopsy is a simple procedure. It's done without needing to stay in the hospital, essentially taking a small piece of tissue from your liver that they can look at under the microscope to determine if it is indeed liver cancer, if it may be a different type of, of you know, primary liver cancer, perhaps a, a biliary tract cancer or something else. So getting a biopsy gives you that definitive answer, is it liver cancer or is it not, okay? Um, can they miss sometimes with biopsy? Absolutely. There may be times when you are asked to get a second biopsy. And I think it's important to understand that certainty in terms of what we're treating is very important to us. And so if you're lucky enough, um, I mean, I wouldn't say lucky is the right word, but if you're if, if your imaging is so characteristic that we don't need to do a biopsy, that's great. But if we ask for a biopsy, it's usually with very good reason, okay? And many of us think the field may be moving to the point where biopsy may inform treatment, in which case biopsy is helpful for us. So I think these are all very important uh, conversations to have with your doctor. You know, are you going to be recommended a biopsy? If not, why not? If so, why? That kind of thing. So bear that in mind if you're if you're told that you know the the what they're seeing on CT or MRI is concerning for for cancer. Once we have a diagnosis of cancer, the next thing we do is staging, and that's when we actually try to make sure that we know exactly where this cancer is and that it hasn't traveled elsewhere. So in the liver, the game changers for traveling elsewhere are when the cancer goes into the vessels of the liver or when the cancer is found somewhere else in the body. Those types of cancers are called advanced cancers, and they have to be treated a little bit differently than cancers that are confined to the liver. So when you ask about staging, it's important to understand what stage you know, your cancer is at and um, what are your available treatment options. Usually before you even speak with your physician about your treatment options, they've already thought about it a lot themselves. And that's something that I think patients and their loved ones may not be aware of is that there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to really discuss your case and what is the best treatment for you as an individual. And that's done in the setting of a tumor board. And so a tumor board is a large group of people that come together to discuss these cases frequently with expertise from many different disciplines like radiology, they read the exams, like pathology, they read the biopsies, like hepatology, the people who take care of your liver disease, oncology, the people who would treat the cancer, interventional radiology, those are people who actually will you know, manage the local therapies to your cancer, as well as palliative care specialists, social workers, care coordinators. Um, there's a lot of different people in the mix and really they're focused on you. So when you think about a team, it's a big team. You have a big team. You may not always meet those team members and you may meet them at different appointments, but the point is, is that there are a lot of people thinking about your case. And we want you to be thinking about your disease, about your goals of care, about your wishes, about you know, who you want to have a second set of ears at this meeting where you're talking about your, your diagnosis and prognosis and the treatment path. So make sure you think about those things because we're thinking about them too. And we want what's best for you, but we won't know what's best for you until you tell us you know, how you want to live your life. You know, it's your body, it's your life, it's you know, you're in charge, so to speak. So once we have the tumor board and we come up with a plan and we've staged you and staging actually happens usually at tumor board, there are exams that are done for staging like chest CT, for example, other staging exams if needed, um, we'll come to you with a plan. And then the plan is really based on your stage. So there are many different types of therapy for liver cancer. There are local treatments that are done um, with either curative intent or palliative intent. Uh, so some of those treatments can be done through uh, the skin, uh, percutaneous treatments where we burn the tumor, for example. They can be done laparoscopically with a surgeon if the tumor is difficult to reach through the skin. You can have a surgical resection or an actual removal of the tumor, and that's usually reserved for people who have very good liver function. Transplantation, again, removing the liver and replacing it with a new one. Those are all considered curative. Um, 
more palliative local therapies. So the liver, the liver cancer is still confined to the liver, but it's, and it's not in the vessels or in the rest of the body. There are palliative therapies that are intended to keep the tumor at bay in the liver. And those are trans arterial therapies like trans arterial chemoembolization or radioembolization that either use chemotherapy or radioactive beads to treat the tumor, but they aren't considered curative. And that's usually in people who have large tumors or many different tumors. Um, and all of this is based on guidance and clinical trials and many clinical studies. But still, we have to think about you, the individual, when we're making these decisions and what are your choices in terms of a more aggressive approach, a less aggressive approach, your other medical problems, um, any contraindications, it all has to be taken into account. So it's not algorithmic. It's not like we have a cookie cutter algorithm that we say, oh, yep, you fit this profile, you're gonna get this. We actually have to really think about it very carefully. Once the tumor has either breached the vessel or gone outside the liver, we think more along the lines of systemic therapies. Um, and those systemic therapies involve medications that can be given by mouth or can be given intravenously. Uh, sometimes singularly and sometimes in combination. These medications are not conventional chemotherapies that you might've heard about in the past where they cause you know, terrible nausea and vomiting or you know, uh, loss of hair or you know, erosion of the mucous membranes. Those aren't the type of therapies we use in, in liver cancer. We use more molecular and immuno-based uh, therapies that affect the immune system or affect the way that the tumor grows or develops its own blood supply. So very different side effect profile. You're gonna hear much more about all of this from the other speakers. Uh, but again, a side effect profile is very important. It's important that you ask, you know, what are the side effects with this medication? You know, we have pharmacists that help us run drug-drug interaction checks to make sure that any of the medicines you are on aren't interacting with these other drugs. Um, but still, you want to have a very good idea of what you're getting into, what you're going to be taking, what's the plan if perhaps you can't tolerate that therapy, or if perhaps you have growth of your tumor on that therapy, what's next? Once you have a therapy, you are then in a surveillance pattern to see what are the effects of those therapies. So we want to continue to do imaging and continue to assess your response. Some people are very fortunate and they have a complete response. Other people don't, and we have to you know, think about changing options. And I think that it's important to remember that cancer therapy has evolved so rapidly and radically over the last two decades that many people actually can live a good quality of life with a cancer that they manage chronically. Uh, and so you know, I, I think when people hear the word cancer, they sort of take a step back and you know, they think their world is coming to an end. And I think the truth is, is that their world is not coming to an end, but you do have to regroup and think about how to move forward. And the team is really there to help you think about how to move forward and to, to live with this cancer in a way that you can still live and enjoy your life. So again, I think it's important to remember that while our options may have been very limited in the past, they're not limited anymore. So it is getting to be a much better time in the treatment of, of liver cancer. Um, I think it's also important if you don't have liver cancer, perhaps you're at risk for liver cancer, you have liver disease, to really think about how to um, engage in, in lifestyle modifications if you can to help with prevention of liver cancer. So you'll be hearing a lot about prevention as well. Um, I think the take home points that I have for you today is, you know, really to understand that our, our, our own understanding as physicians and scientists of liver cancer and, and predominantly hepatocellular carcinoma, our understanding is evolving rapidly and that really affects the entire continuum of care. So there are clinical trials ongoing. There are many, many different studies. We're hoping to have you know, biomarkers where we can, you know, look at risk and prognosis and response to therapy. And all of this is coming down the pike. So it's a very interesting and, and really amazing time in, in the study of liver cancer. We do have to embrace technology, complexity, and team-based care. So there are a lot of different ways that we practice science and medicine now. And we really have to do this in a way that affords our patients precision you know, individualized best possible outcomes. 
We know from studies and from our practice in liver cancer that a multidisciplinary approach is the mainstay for our decision making so that we do come together to make these decisions as a team. And ideally we should always be pushing the envelope and that is usually done in a clinical trial setting so we can be sure that we're pushing the envelope in the right way. And the only way we can advance science is through scientific discovery in clinical trials with patients. And so I have to thank every patient who's ever participated or wants to participate in a clinical trial. And so I think in the future, we'll see a, a real surge with our large scale observational and sort of omic data, genomic, proteomic data that will help inform trial design and also determining biomarkers. And we really should think about how we're gonna be studying these new medications and where they fit in the treatment paradigm for liver cancer. Um, again, you know, liver function is always the most important deciding factor in, in your treatment therapy and, and the cascade of your treatment. Um, and remember that there's, there's really new discoveries coming and we're very excited. So we're so excited to have you today, to listen to us, to ask us questions. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Ivory so she can introduce Dr. Guy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patty. That was great information. If anyone who's watching today joining us has any questions, please make sure to post in our Q&A section. Dr. Guy is a transplant hepatologist at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, where she runs the liver cancer and liver lesion program. She is the department lead for the hepatology division, the patient experience officer for the CM. PC Advanced Organ Therapy Service Line and the chair of her hospital's Physician Wellness Committee. Welcome, Dr. Guy. And you're on mute. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Guy, and um, I it says um, just I'm going to try to share my screen, but it says host disabled participants share screening, Erica. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Guy and I'm a transplant hepatologist and I am going to talk to you today about liver disease um, prevention and screening. And we've been doing this um, talk for some time now, this is our third year. And in the past, um, I haven't used slides, but this year I thought I would try something different where I would give a visual representation of some of the things we're talking about. And so if you're a visual learner like me, go ahead and, and look at the slides. And if not, please just go ahead and listen. Um, and I'll cover a lot of what Dr. Patty just said um, and what some other speakers are gonna be saying as well. But the overall goal for this symposium is to hear things in different ways on multiple occasions so that it starts to really think, sink in as you think about your liver and liver health. So thank you to the American Liver Foundation for organizing this seminar and for inviting me to be a participant. So the questions we'll cover today include, what causes liver disease? Do all liver diseases increase the risk of cancer? How do we screen for liver disease and liver cancer? And what do we do to prevent liver cancer um, and screen for liver cancer? So where is the liver and what does it do? So you can think of your liver as a triangle on the right side of your body. It's kind of tucked up right under the ribs. And when we think about the liver, we divide it into the left and right lobe because of anatomic considerations if we're thinking about surgeries and other procedures. You can see on this graphic, it's like a triangle and it has lots of neighbors. The gallbladder hangs off the liver, the pancreas is nearby, the intestines are running all through the abdomen and near the liver, the stomach is near the liver and the spleen as well. So sometimes people will say, oh, I have pain in my liver. And we're really thinking as physicians and care providers, well, is it really the liver or could it be one of the other neighboring structures? Um, I see that there may be a participant that raised a hand, um, Erica. I'll let me know in the chat if you'd like me to respond. Um, the, the liver disease is involved in many functions, involved in digestion, immune system, bleeding system, clearing of toxins and processing of medications. And so I think of the liver as the quarterback of the body. And I often describe this to my patients that the quarterback, the, the, the liver is involved in so many important plays that the body is making. Um, and so it's really fundamental to how all the systems work together. So 
As Dr. Tatey mentioned, there are many causes of liver disease in this country, but the most common ones are non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which we're going to talk about in more detail, alcohol liver disease, hepatitis C virus and hepatitis B virus, and then also autoimmune liver diseases and genetic liver diseases. So there's an important spectrum of liver disease that was also mentioned. And, you know, sometimes we use the word disease and people automatically get sort of worried that it's like worst case scenario. And that's not necessarily the case. And so I put liver condition here just to remind us that indeed there is a spectrum. And so if you have a liver it, disease condition, for example, those five causes I just listed, the question is, is it causing inflammation and irritation to the liver? And is that irritation going on to cause injury and scarring? And another word for scarring that you may have heard about is this word fibrosis. And there are different stages of fibrosis, early scarring, is stage one fibrosis, and advanced scarring is stage four fibrosis or cirrhosis. So again, getting this sense that there is indeed a spectrum of liver disease. If patients have cirrhosis, then they're at risk for liver cancer. As mentioned, this is the traditional way we think about liver cancer, though there are some exceptions that we'll talk about, including hepatitis B, fatty liver disease, and we're gonna go through this more. But overall, in people who have cirrhosis, the risk of liver cancer is about three to 7% per year. Another graphic and visualization to think about, and I tell my patients this, is that the normal liver is like a peach. It's soft and fleshy. And the cirrhotic liver is like a cauliflower or a broccoli. It's sort of hard and shrunken, lumpy, bumpy around the edges. And so when we get to the point of cirrhosis, you can imagine that if there is that much scarring, there's a potential in the future for abnormality or problems, including cancer. So not everyone with liver disease gets scarring, as also mentioned. And so this is where it's really important to, number one, say, hey, do I have liver disease or a liver condition? How does my doctor know? And your doctor can test for liver disease by checking for liver inflammation. These are tests like AST and ALT, alkaline phosphatase. We can test for if the liver inflammation has affected liver function with tests like bilirubin and INR and albumin. And then we can test for what might be the cause of liver disease by taking a history, doing a physical exam. And also there are these tests called serologies, which are different tests we can check in the blood to identify if it's autoimmune liver disease or a genetic disease or hepatitis B, hepatitis C. So the first is establishing, do I have a diagnosis of liver disease? And then the next question is, do I have scarring? Do I have cirrhosis since there are implications to having that progression of injury. So how do I know? So there's a toolkit that doctors have in terms of figuring out if someone has scarring. We can use a liver biopsy to say what is the cause of damage and how much damage, i.e. how much scarring or that fibrosis we've talked about is there. We can use something called a fiber scan, which is a special kind of ultrasound that uses sound waves going back and forth through the liver. How fast they travel is related to resistance and that re resistance is related to scarring. We can use things like MRI or ultrasound elastography. These are all ways to get a sense of, is there scarring in the liver? There are other tests like ultrasound, but this really helps more with when we're seeing advanced changes of scarring like cirrhosis. And as I mentioned, lab tests, physical exam, and history can be really helpful to your care provider in getting a better sense of where do you stand on the spectrum of liver disease? And from that standpoint, what is your risk for problems in the future? Ultimately, though, we want to prevent liver disease to begin with. And then if someone does have liver disease, we want to prevent the scarring. So we're now going to switch our focus to prevention. So how do we prevent liver disease? Well, it depends on what kind of liver disease someone has. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is one of the most common causes of liver disease in this country. And the major risk factors are obesity and diabetes. So the goal is weight loss through healthy diet and exercise. And we know that if you lose seven to 10% of your body weight, the fat can come out of the liver. So there's a way to actually reverse the problems that can develop from having fat in the liver. Improvement in diabetic control and optimization of diabetic control can really help optimize non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
alcohol liver disease, obviously the main risk factor here is excessive alcohol intake. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what is excessive alcohol intake. And if you have liver disease, you should not drink alcohol. And this is a really important conversation to be having with your physicians. And if you have cirrhosis, you should not be drinking alcohol. And if you have other liver diseases, it's really important to understand what might be safe for you. Hepatitis C virus is recommended to screen for in all adults over the age of 18 by the CDC. And as mentioned, we have excellent treatments that can actually cure hepatitis C, which is really a revolution in our field. Um, and we are really excited that this can happen. Hepatitis B virus, we talk about screening patients who are at high risk for hepatitis B, and often this is related to where someone is born across the world, as there are areas where hepatitis B infection is more common. And in those patients, some, some, of, some of those who have gone on to have difficulty either because of significant problems with irritation and inflammation of the liver or scarring, we can treat hepatitis B to control the disease so it doesn't cause damage. Autoimmune liver disease and genetic liver diseases, we have treatments and so it's really important to be engaging with your physicians about what are my diagnoses, what are my treatments, are my treatments working to prevent inflammation and injury. The CDC definitions of weight and body mass index, I got this from the CDC website and this is a way for you to check and see how am I doing with where I am on my weight spectrum. And you can type in CDC BMI calculator and you'll see this calculator and what body mass index is, is it's a ratio of your weight to height. Um, and you can see in the spectrum of colors that normal body weight is a body mass index of 18.5 to 24.5, about 25. Um, and you can see, am I overweight? Am I underweight? How might I think about nutrition and diet and exercise to move myself into a place where it's healthy for my body? And we're going to be having talks this um, conference about healthy eating and cooking demonstrations. So it's really, these are things that we have the agency to change in, our, in ourselves. So it's just something to think about a little bit more. This is the, from the CDC as well. And these are recommendations for alcohol intake. Um, and drinking in moderation for the CDC guidelines is one drink or less a day for women and for men, two drinks or less a day. I like to talk to my patients about remembering that really daily drinking is, 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 is not something that we should be doing. And we should really be thinking about what is the healthy amount of intake for ourselves. I have patients who say to me, but doc, I'm not drinking. I don't drink hard, health, or hard alcohol, I just drink beer or I just drink wine. And I remind them that all of those substances, beer, wine, hard alcohol, spirits, they all contain alcohol content. And so each type of beverage may have a different quantity of alcohol. So the actual amount of alcohol to get the same effect at the liver might be different. For example, at 1.5 ounces of a shot of hard alcohol or a five ounce glass of wine, they have the same effect at the level of the liver. Um, and so it's really important to be thinking about how are we using alcohol in our daily lives? So just kind of summarizing where we've been in these last several minutes is, we want to prevent liver damage, but if we have any type of liver damage, we want to think about, am I the right person to be screening for liver cancer? So the first box is just talking about, let's treat the underlying causes of liver disease through medications, lifestyle modifications. And then the second box is talking about, okay, let's say you have cirrhosis of the liver. You should be screened for liver cancer. And hepatitis B, as mentioned, is, is a difference um, because you do not need to have cirrhosis in order to develop liver cancer. And I wanna kind of talk about this a little bit, like why is cirrhosis a risk factor for liver cancer? And what happens in scarring and cirrhosis is you can imagine if you cut your hand and it, it, you get a scar, that scar looks a little bit different than the rest of the skin around it. And that's what's happening at the level of the liver over time, you're getting more and more scar. The liver is trying to respond to the injury by healing it appropriately, but it heals it inappropriately and you put down scar. That scar ultimately gets to a place of cirrhosis uh, and the cirrhosis, those liver cells are damaged and they can mutate. And what cancer is, is a cell that mutates, doesn't listen to the rules of stopping if you're not, you know, stopping growing if you're actually abnormal, it just keeps growing and that's what a cancer is. And so cirrhosis is a risk factor. 
hepatitis B is a risk factor for cancer because hepatitis B is something called a DNA virus. And so our bodies are made of DNA. So hepatitis B can actually get into the DNA of a cell in the liver as an example. And then if that cell mutated, it could grow into cancer. And that's why hepatitis B is a risk factor for liver cancer, even if you don't have cirrhosis. There are other things to be aware of, which really require a conversation with your doctor because there's a lot of nuance here, but people with fatty liver disease, some of them develop liver cancer without having advanced cirrhosis. And so talking to your doctor about where do I sit in the spectrum and is it right for me to be getting screened? And people who have had hepatitis C damage to cirrhosis, they've treated, they've cured their hepatitis C and their liver has gotten a little bit better. The question there is, do I still need to be screened? And oftentimes the answer is yes, if you've had cirrhosis, you should continue to be screened. So what are the, so I just wanna make sure that this is very clear because it, there are so many nuances in these things and that's why having the knowledge for yourself but then putting into the context of talking with your doctor is so helpful because sometimes, you know, it's, it's the, the details around these decisions that are really important to engage your care provider in. So just as a general bullet point in terms of who should be screened for liver cancer, it goes with hepatitis B and there are different age cutoffs that we use and different specific um, points that are here in gray. Again, I don't wanna lose everyone in the details and your physicians should know these details, but if you are a man with hepatitis B over 40 years old, it's recommended that you start routine surveillance for liver cancer. If you're a woman with hepatitis B over 50 years old, it's recommended you start routine surveillance. If you have a family history of liver cancer and hepatitis B, it's recommended you screen. So there are groups within this. You might ask, well, what if I'm less what if I'm younger than 40 or 50 based on my um, gender? Well, we often in, in the liver world screen people, but we screen them once a year rather than when I'm explaining is the routine, which is every six months. Again, lots of details, but the bottom line is if you are in one of these categories, talk to your doctor about where you sit in terms of their recommendations. So what are the screening tests for uh, liver cancer screening? Um, ultrasound and alpha feeder protein. The ultrasound here, there's a graphic of what an ultrasound looks like when the physicians are reading it. And then the alpha feeder protein is a blood test. The ultrasound is where we put a probe on the right side of the liver where I showed you the liver was. And there are shades of gray, white, and black. And the radiologists understand the nuances of these things and they're looking for places that look abnormal. And so I put some arrows on the ultrasound here where you can see that there is less gray, more black in an area. And that is like, oh, there's something that the ultrasound is abnormal. What does this mean? Uh, and then we would go to the next step. We'll talk about the fact that the alpha feeder protein, which is another one of the tests we use, the blood test, is not perfect either. Neither, neither of these are, and that's why we recommend doing them every six months. We can see trends as examples, but the alpha feeder protein, people with liver cancer can have a normal level of this um, tumor marker. Up to a third of people with liver cancer can have a normal level. So again, in and of itself, either of these tests alone is not enough to make a diagnosis of liver cancer. These are just ways for us to get a sense of is there a potential problem that we should move forward with? I just wanted to remind us that not all spots mean the same thing. And I tell this to my patients because if you are a 50 year old woman with hepatitis B and you're gonna be getting ultrasounds every six months for the rest of your life, you might be getting a lot of ultrasounds. And so sometimes there'll be a spot on the liver and we'll be like, what does this actually mean? Um, and I just wanted to remind us that spots, doctors use words like spots, lesion, nodule, mass, but not all of these represent liver cancer. There can be non-cancerous masses, or there could be things that we see on ultrasound that actually don't sort of pan out when we look more sensitively with other types of imaging that I'll outline. The types of liver cancer that we see in the liver, as mentioned, are liver cancers from the liver cells. That's called hepatocellular carcinoma. There can be cancer from the bile ducts, which is called cholangiocarcinoma, and there can be cancer that spreads from outside the liver, from other places with cancer, like 
the colon or the breast and it goes to the liver and that's called a metastasis. Liver cancer diagnosis by CT scan or MRI is ultimately how we say, hey, it was one of those spots, a concerning spot. And I like to call this the light bulb effect. Um, and what it is, is with a CT scan or MRI, we use contrast. And so we can actually see how the blood is flowing through these spots. And what liver cancer does is it lights up really bright when the blood flows through at a certain time. And then when the blood kind of goes away at a certain time, it gets dark. So you can see with these arrows, you've got a light bulb and then the light bulb goes dark. And so if we see this in the right context of someone with hepatitis B or someone with cirrhosis, this is what Dr. Tati was talking about, where we don't always need a liver biopsy because this is very, very suggestive of a liver cancer. Sometimes people have spots and they don't follow these rules of the light bulb effect. And then we have to talk about should we biopsy. So ultimately, the reminder here today is that there's a spectrum of liver disease and some people will go on to get scarring ultimately cirrhosis, which is scarring of the whole liver, and then cancer. And so really what we want to do is prevent there from being a problem to begin with. So by eating a healthy diet, which we're going to talk about during this seminar, maintaining your ideal body weight and using that calculator to understand where in the spectrum you may sit, talking to your doctor about alcohol use, what's healthy, what might not be healthy, exercising, not only because it's good for the liver, but it's good for your heart, it's good for your mood and sleep treating the underlying conditions we have medications for, and then talking to your doctor if you're at high risk for liver cancer, and then doing the ultrasound and alpha feeder protein every six months and following up on the results to understand if there are concerns. So I'd like to thank you all for listening, um, and I'll turn it back to uh, um, uh, uh, um, Allison. Thank you so much, Dr. Guy. That was great information. Before we head to our next presentation, we're going to take a poll. We can pull our poll up. Wonderful. Have you participated in one of these treatments? We'll give you guys about 40 seconds to complete the poll if you would uh, like. And our next session will be on treatment. So this is the um, perfect opportunity to get some poll numbers on this particular topic. Thanks so much, Ivory. And uh, again, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, oh, wait, Dr. Uh, Abu Alpha, we, we, we did the poll. Hopefully everyone can see the results of the poll. Oh, um, sure, sure. So are you able to see that poll, Dr. No, I'm not. Can you re-click them? Okay. No, no. 17% uh, have had a transplant. 58% local therapies. That's a, the largest number, which is great. Um, and then 42% surgeries and radiofrequency ablation. Um, and then 25% for the last one. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, okay. Yeah, so we will now introduce Dr. Abu Alpha, who is not only one of our planning committee members, but is a board certified medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, who treats patients with gastrointestinal cancer. His specialty is in primary liver cancer, pancreas, gallbladder, and bile duct tumors. And he is the co author of 100 Questions About Liver Cancer That I Keep by My Desk at All Times. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Abel Alpha. Well, thanks so much, Ivory. And uh, hello again, and good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, really, I would like to uh, first congratulate uh, Dr. Guy for an excellent presentation. Take my word, everybody who's listening to us, we learn always from each other. And uh, especially we are in different specialties, but we really work always as a team with the gastroenterologist, hepatologist, uh, the medical oncologist, of course, the surgeon, interventional audiologist, and, uh, and uh, of course, many other specialties as well. Uh, with this said, I'm very uh, happy to see the responses that we got. 
If anything, uh, in a way, it's not really that surprising um, because it tells us that thankfully we have good access to care and good access to therapy. And it's nice to see this kind of, you know, bell shaped curve in regard to the different uh, therapies that you uh, have experience with or had experience with. And uh, just give it a little bit of sense, uh, no doubt that uh, on top of the uh, list of the systemic therapies uh, is the aspire for and go for uh, curative intent. Of course, we want to cure uh, everybody if we can. And uh, many of you uh, brought in the uh, transplant, uh, either received transplant or had experience with transplant. And no doubt that this is a uh, ultimate option for the therapy. And to try to explain it, uh, we have to remember that the transplant is not truly about the cancer itself. It's about the sick liver, per se. And when I say sick liver, it doesn't mean like it's sick, it's not doing its job, but simply it's the environment which is sick that can produce cancers. And for that reason, the transplant, as many of you know, there are certain very specific criteria which will limit how much cancer there could be. And based on those limited criteria, how much cancer there could be, if the patient is otherwise amenable for a transplant based on liver functionality not being that good in general, even though some argue even in good liver function, we can do that because it's really the most or ultimate cure per se, then of course we go for a transplant. As you can imagine, the transplant is a, you know, uh, based on uh, ask and demand because if we don't have enough liver, we're going to be on a wait list until a liver uh, does take place uh, or, or, or happen to, to, be, to take place. And if anything, I would start by a uh, most important message, as we all are involved and uh, for our dear patients to make sure that there is accessibility to the organs, um, please, please at least have thought about making sure that you post yourself as a potential donor. Uh, and uh, why do we say that? Because for, especially for the loved ones over here, because your DMV will be happy to post that on uh, your card or your driving license, because you know you never know how it goes in life, but at least having a posting of liver donor will be very important to provide those appropriate organs for our dear patients when never needed. The message for the patients is, uh, no doubt, number one, if you are amenable to a transplant and eligible to a transplant, and of course you are keen on having transplant, of course, the transplant teams all around the country are always readily available to really help you out in every way they can. And uh, no doubt that's gonna be a little bit of a patient's game, but at the same time, you have to have faith because you never know when you might get your liver and you probably would be getting your liver at the time where really you're probably expecting it the least. And as you all know, there are certain criteria, no need to go through them uh, today, but those are involved in that experience and trying to cover everything in the 20 minutes we have. But those are you know, um, involved in that experience. They know very well about uh, the scoring uh, system that will permit them to be uh, uh, higher potential eligibility for the transplant versus not. And the score, of course, it all depends like how sick the liver is. And of course, we're gonna always try to help who really need the help the most. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's very important the counteract uh, to this is please, please, we need to make sure, remember, that if we don't get transplanted, it does not mean that's it, we're giving up. Absolutely not. There's still a lot of things that we can do. There's a lot of kind of, you know, therapies that are available, including curative ones, which we'll talk about in a second. But it's not like transplant or no, this will be the answer. Uh, clearly, it's not. Not only that, but one of our biggest fear is that sometimes we might actually push for a transplant or really kind of squeeze things for a transplant. And guess what? It's not going to work. And there'll be a recurrence of cancer. And this is a very important point, especially with the advent of what we're going to talk about quite a bit in a second. Immunotherapy uh, is going to be very critical because we cannot give immunotherapy for a transplanted patient because we are actually unleashing the immune system against uh, the body. And if you have immunosuppression to protect the liver, which was donated by a foreign liver slash from another person, this can really create a little bit of a complexity that will not permit us to get therapy. So for that reason, we have to really put it within the context of what's needed. We like to get transplant, but if we don't give it, it does not mean we're giving up. There could be other options as well. So what are the other options? No doubt that other than transplant itself, there's surgery. We can definitely ask our expert surgeons, whatever they are around the country, 
to really have resection of the tumor itself. And this by itself can be having a curative intent and patients will be cured hopefully from it and then will carry on. Another option is radiofrequency ablation. This is, means that we're ablating the tumor, we're killing the tumor by radiofrequency. And this is really specifically that procedure is contrary to what we talk about intermediate stage, i.e. local therapies. This is a procedure which is made for curative intent. This is a curative surgery. It usually apply for a small tumor like two centimeter or what have we, instead of going for a big surgery, we'll just do the ablation itself. And by all means, these two therapies would be available if, again, and this is a message that we heard from our colleagues, like Dr. Guy, Dr. Guy and others, please, very important, that if we have a situation of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, make sure we do go for screening because the earlier we find things, the better we can have a curative intent as we're talking from the surgery or the RFA as well. Now, one of the questions that many of us ask and many of our dear patients will ask, uh, okay, I get the surgery, now what? And uh, sadly, this is one thing that we're still working on. We're trying to get an answer for everybody is can we add what we call adjuvant therapy, A-D-G-U-V-A-N-T. Adjuvant therapy means like an enhanced therapy that will prevent any potential recurrence of cancer. It's not because like the surgeon did not do a good job. Absolutely not. This is really a great surgery, but sadly, cancer cells can float somewhere and it will be a good idea to kill them before they become established a new home, especially in the liver. We don't have that data yet. We tried in different ways. We don't have good results on it. We're still working on it. And if anything, like for example, Dr. Granton, who's gonna to talk to you in a second as well from the NCI, Dr. Granton, myself and other colleagues, we're all trying to do these things together. And uh, if anything, uh, it will uh, probably hopefully get an answer, but we just have data for it. But for now, there's no answer for systemic therapy uh, as a adjuvant therapy. We just have to be a little bit patient and uh, and see uh, where this might take us. So be patient with it, but not feel despaired if we don't have systemic therapy as adjuvant therapy yet, we'll get to it. For now, make sure however you continue to be screened and followed by your doctors after the surgery or the RFA. Now, let's assume that the cancer is in the liver. It's not really uh, spelled out of the liver, but at the same time, maybe close to blood vessels, doesn't look really in the best of places. And as such, there'll be kind of like a question about, can we uh, control it still, despite it's only in the liver? And the question, and the answer is, yes, we can. And this is a very important point. Actually, most of you answered that they had experience with the local therapies and were not surprised. Because if anything, we have many uh, different approaches, among which some of them, that you either had experience with or you were talking about with your doctor or you had experience with, including chemoembolization, where you give an embolization plus chemotherapy. What is that? Simply what we're doing is because for an important point, the uh, embolization is uh, a way to kill the tumor that feeds mainly on the blood from our artery, uh, from the blood supply of the hepatic artery or liver artery. Interestingly, because we have dual supply in the liver, because all the blood below our liver and our body get cleaned up in the liver, this is the venous blood or the vein blood. It's still blood. It's not the cleanest, but it's still blood. And we can depend on that. So if we embolize, i.e. we kill the blood supply on the cancer cell, on the arterial supply, we can depend on the venous supply. That's really the kind of you know, big plus that we have for liver cancer, which we don't have in any other organ. So with this said, uh, the embolization will apply that little beads uh, that kind of like, you know, will try to sur uh, surround the tumor blood flow and it will kind of kill the blood flow to it and the tumor die. And we call it chemoembolization because those little beads were also either having embedded in them some chemotherapy or infused some chemotherapy before them. We can do it actually, believe it or not, there's data also it can be done without the chemotherapy. It can be done simply but just by killing the blood supply. And there has been studies, uh, some of them came out from here from Sloan Kettering. There was no difference at all in regard to with or without chemotherapy. We, however, respectfully defer to your doctors because there could be some other arguments why this or that, but at least this option is available. Or you can also add radiation therapy to the little beads. 
So it become what we call, and some of you know about that, radio embolization. Same concept, same process, but simply we're having now little radioactive material in those little beads rather than just either inert, bland, or with chemotherapy. In regard to local therapy as well, even though it's a little bit of the uh, latest comer to the field is radiation therapy. Because historically, we always were nervous about giving radiation therapy to the liver because the liver, as you can imagine, is a very soft organ and you don't want to kind of like, you know, hurt it or cause a problem or damage more than what we have. But now with the advent of regard to the radiation therapy, there's a little bit of better understanding on it. There's a lot of data coming on in that regard. We could not really say it's a automatic stand of care, but definitely it's kind of, you know, doing its kind of, you know, uh, uh, or contributing its presence through the great work happening from throughout the world to really establish itself as a therapy or a local therapy for liver cancer. Now, now that we spoke about transplant, we spoke about the surgery and radio frequency ablation, we spoke about the local therapy being chemotherapy with embolization, we spoke about bland embolization, we spoke about radiotherapy with embolization, and we spoke about radiation therapy. Sadly still, despite that, as about a quarter plus of you said they have experience with systemic therapy, sadly disease can still recur even after transplant, even after systemic therapy, uh, even after surgery, even after radiofilibation, even after local therapy, the cancer might come and spread even to other organs. Actually, even if it's still, still in the liver only, systemic therapy might be even more valuable than local therapy. There are some theories. Among one of them is, to a certain extent, if the tumor is limited to a certain number of lesions in the liver and size of the lesion in the liver, there has been data that showed that actually systemic therapy might be more important than local therapy. And of course, as we said, some people will have the need for local therapy because of the spread to cancer already. The good news is, thankfully, and the good news is thanks to a lot of credits over here, I can't tell you how important this is, over the last probably close to about 20 years, we were able to bring in so much therapy for liver cancer that really, thankfully, all does a great job. It all started with an attempt for chemotherapy. It did not work. Chemotherapy in that disease that not, does not really do a good job. There is some exceptions for some work on specific form of chemotherapy, but really it's a default only if we really need another option of therapy. But the more important is we were dependent on certain magic pills that are called tyrosine kinase inhibitor. SA inhibitor is a biologic therapy that really will go after a specific target. And you probably are very familiar with the name of one of them. Uh, it has been with us for the longest time called sorafenib. And there is another one called lenvatinib, which is more novel than sorafenib and even probably more potent, even though they're equal in regard to what they can contribute, but still has certain added potency. And of course, uh, there's others as well, among which a a drug that's called rigorafenib, but this will require prior sorafenib exposure and prior tolerance to sorafenib, so a little bit conditional. Another one's called ramucirumab, which again require a certain important limitation like alpha fetoprotein regard needs to be at about a, a higher in a certain level. So this is great, but add to this, there's one which really, I have to admit, it fascinates me always the most, not because I kind of led that effort worldwide, but because really it was quite amazing. It was the only one without any conditions. It's called cabozantinib. And cabozantinib can be given not only in what we call second line therapy, in other words, after we tried something else like lenvatinib as first line or anything else, but can be also used in third line therapy. It's the only drug approved in third line therapy. And by all means, it's well tolerated as well. These are all pills, and you probably will see your doctors probably prescribe one or the other. However, a very even more advanced part of the story, as you probably are aware of and some of you have experience with, is immunotherapy. And that's really a great, great event that we are all very happy about and very proud of. To explain to you what immunotherapy is, and it's very important, immunotherapy is not like we are trying to send immune cells ourselves. No, the immune cells are in the body already. All what we're doing is we're training the immune cells in your body to fight the cancer. Think about it this way. The cancer, pick up the phone and talk to the immune system saying, guys, we're friends, don't bug us, we don't bug you. And that's why 
Interestingly, our immune system doesn't detect the cancer, even though it technically is foreign. However, what we do is we kind of like, you know, enhance our own immune system by the immunotherapy. I always jokingly say that as if like the cancer being the nice guy will give a nice chair for the immune cells to sit on and this way they don't touch the floor or the surface of the cancer cell. All what immunotherapy is, think about this way, is kicking that chair out so the immune cell will fall onto the cancer. That's all what it is. I'm probably, probably uh, simplifying it. It's way more complex than that, but this is really the basics of it. Interestingly, though, we tried the immunotherapy by itself. We were very excited about it. And however, we discovered not too quick, um, after a lot of attempts, and to give credit for all the efforts that have been done by everybody, that by itself does not do the job. If anything, it would require or does do a job with certain equivalence to the pills that I just spoke about, like cabozantinib, lymphatinib, sorafenib, etc. On the other hand, though, it does do a, the job and do even a better job if we kind of add another drug to it. That's a very interesting important component. You remember the story about the cell on the chair and we were trying to kick the chair out so the cell can fall to fight the cancer? Well, guess what? That kicking of the chair, as we said, is not enough by itself. It requires a phone call from the upper chain of command. Some boss up there, wherever in the immune system, mainly in the lymph node or through the pathway of from the lymph node to the cell, has to send a specific message, kick that chair out so the immune cells can attack the cancer. Good combination that I'm sure you heard about. One of them is what we call atezolizumab plus bafizumab. That's one of them. And many of you probably are on it already. Another one is the one that was relatively recently reported. It's called Darvalumab plus Tremelumab, even though between caveat here, it's not yet FDA approved, but the data was reported positive. And sadly, some of them did not do well. And uh, we heard lately in Paris about some of them that did not do the good job in red court. It doesn't matter. Most importantly, as you see, this is a big plus, is that there are way too many options. And if anything, your doctors definitely will be able to offer you way too many therapies. Could there be like, ah, uh, I'm confused. There are too many options over here. By all means, we do understand that and we do recognize that. And yes, there could be certain assets that are important in that regard. Your doctor might bring in like, oh, what's your risk factor to begin with? What's hepatitis B or hepatitis C? What's your other immune you know, system working? Is it against any immune disease or what have you have? Very important one, do you have any varices or bleeding potential in the esophagus? This is what they do endoscopy. And it could be that the drug has certain antibodies in your body against it. And a lot of variables over here, not to overwhelm you with them, but it's very important to have that open discussion with the doctor to understand really why we're choosing whatever we're choosing, why at the same time uh, we are not choosing what, for example, we selected not to. And your doctors, I'm sure they will be super capable of telling you exactly what their argument behind any of them. So with this said, uh, we can really conclude that uh, number one, thankfully we do cure patients with liver cancer. Sadly, not everybody, there'll be some that will get only local therapy, but to their credit, it can control the disease. And at the same time, patients who recur with the cancer or present with advanced cancer to begin with, the good news is, and this really, really, I can't tell you how they like them. I kind of will tell you, many of us have been in this disease uh, field forever. And it's beyond grateful to us to see that we have options for our patients to make sure that we treat their cancer and keep them going in their life. So good news, and we have options, and we're happy to always talk to any of you about all of them. I stop here, and I pass it back to Ivory. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Abel. Our last presentation for this session will be Dr. Ivory we have Dr. Doremer is a cl clinical associate professor at the University of Florida College of Pharmacy and serves as the assistant director of experimental therapeutics group at the University of Florida Health Cancer Center. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Ivory. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for my slides.
Ivory? Yes, we see your desktop. Oh, it says Zoom quit unexpectedly. Sorry, that's why I was concerned. Oh, well, you're still here, so that's good. <laughs> okay, it said my Zoom crash. I was concerned. <laughs> So thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is David Dreamer once again, and I currently work in the clinical trials realm where oftentimes I interact with uh, patients with liver cancer in the setting of uh, uh, progressing through their either first or second line therapy and then the looking for clinical trials. Um, my disclosures are seen here. I've served on a couple of advisory boards over the last 24 months, one of which being with uh, BMS and an immunotherapy themed uh, melanoma group as well as I've worked with a small biotech company that's uh, developing new drugs, uh, specifically targeting uh, to prevent metastatic pathways. Dr. Dreamer, I apologize to stop you. We currently don't see your slides. We only see your homepage, like the, your desktop of your computer. So you might want to stop sharing and try it again. My apologies. That's okay. You think by now we'd have this figured out? <laughs> Do you see it now? It says, yes, we see it now. Okay. Objectives. Objectives. Okay, sorry. You're still here. <laughs> Are you seeing all this? Yeah, your slides did disappear. Okay, I don't know what's going on with Zoom. Uh, so for today's 20 minute talk, I have two objectives. First is to discuss the emerging landscape of uh, drug therapy and HCC. I've really focused on HCC given the uh, time constraints as well as some of the drug therapies which have been uh, developed over the past uh, probably five to eight years. We've seen a revolution of uh, new drugs in this setting. And I know Dr. Abu Alpha just described some of those and I'll really sort of focus in some of the toxicities of these agents uh, specifically at a patient level and the management of these toxicities associated with some of these systemic therapies. Um, from a recommended st therapy standpoint, uh, these are the current NCC and recommended guideline suggestions or recommendations. So you can see here uh, just broadly, um, there are a lot of agents that are listed here. Uh, this is a positive sign because there are uh, numerous drugs which have been added to this uh, schema that you see here over the past several years. Uh, you can see your first line from a preferred regimen standpoint, the Tezobev arm that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Abo Alpha just mentioned is a preferred regimen in a first line setting. Uh, this was published uh, about two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was from a phase three study called the Empower uh, 150 trial, uh, which showed uh, benefit of using uh, immunotherapy agent that we'll be talking about, as well as what's referred to as a VEGF inhibitor. But as you can see here on the slide, there's other recommended therapies and then certain drugs that are also used in certain circumstances. I'm going to try to hit all of these drugs, at least with one slide over the next uh, uh, several minutes. Uh, but as you can see here, we've mentioned immunotherapy in the last speaker, but as you can see here, durvalumab, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, you're hearing these MAB sounds. So these are monoclonal antibodies, which are targeting the immune system. I'll have a little bit of discussion on here momentarily. And then some of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors that were also mentioned, regorafenib, cabozantinib, ramucirumab, lymvatinib. So a, a truly revolutionized um, um, a drug uh, development uh, process recently as it relates to a lot of these new drugs coming to market. So I mean, clearly, if you've watched TV, you've seen a lot of the direct consumer advertising commercials as it relates to some of the agents that are currently on the market. We clearly have been in the era of immunotherapy over the past decade, uh, specifically with the development of uh, what we refer to as PD-1 inhibitors. We'll talk about that here momentarily. Um, but clearly, the, uh, some of these new checkpoint inhibitors uh, have been the featured of, of numerous um, uh, high-tier scientific magazines and journals. And uh, Dr. James Allison, one of the uh, 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 leaders in this field at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, was uh, recently awarded the uh, Nobel Prize uh, of medicine in this set, setting with his points or his uh, progress in the development of uh, 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 checkpoint inhibition pathways. So real basically, as we've talked about these drugs, um, I have a tendency to think about uh, how immune checkpoint inhibitors work as a gas pedal brake uh, sort of analogy. 
And the, the, these, these antibodies that we've developed, such as ipilimumab or nivolumab or pembrolizumab, are basically effectively, if you have a, a driver who's got their foot on the brake, you're effectively with these agents, with these developments of these monoclonal antibodies, as effectively taking uh, your immune system's foot off the brake, right? So inevitably looking at these processes, you can see on this slide here. So if you're developing an antibody here, then this T cell could become active and then lead to tumor cell death. Similarly over here with a different pathway with something called PDL1 or program death ligand one, the development of these monon monoclonal antibodies allow this T cell to see this tumor cell as being foreign and then basically effectively activating the immune system. We currently have two broad classes uh, until recently. Now we have another one, um, but uh, we refer to these as CTLA-4 inhibitors, such as ipilimumab, and then program death one receptor inhibitors or PD-1 or PDL-1 inhibitors seen here. And of course, these have been uh, really becoming in the, the mainstay of treatment of HCC patients here more recently. I did mention there was another immune checkpoint inhibitor um, a, a group that was just approved, and that's called LAG-3, but that's only approved right now in the setting of melanoma. But clearly the PD-1 inhibitors have entered the landscape of the treatment of HCC and have been very effective in some patient populations. So from a management strategy perspective, these agents, yes, you've probably heard that they have a different profile than does our traditional chemotherapeutic agents, which oftentimes come with a fair amount of nausea and vomiting, hair loss, uh, as well as uh, counts decline, particularly in, in your, some of your white counts and some of your platelets. So these drugs have a very different side effect profile. And I will say they'd have a very diverse set of uh, adverse events. And oftentimes these are due to what's referred to as cytokine release by activated T cells. And clearly I think uh, as all of us in healthcare uh, are, have seen over the past several years is that this really requires a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, I know our clinical trials group, if we have an immunotherapy um, a patient who's uh, having issues, particularly with endocrine issues, then oftentimes we have an endocrinologist engaged in their care. And this is uh, becoming more and more common as uh, we see more and more patients with what I refer to as combination immunotherapy, where sometimes two uh, checkpoint inhibitors can be given uh, for a patient's treatment. These can be serious adverse events, and oftentimes this does require prompt recognition of treatment, and it does require patient and healthcare profession education. On the right side of the screen, you're seeing some of the, what I refer to some of the, the, the uncommon grade three and fours, but you do see this in practice, particularly in the combination. So the first one you see that's a hypophysitis, that's in a large pituitary gland. Oftentimes a, a patient would, ref, re, would refer to having the, a really bad headache, like the worst they've ever had. This is a rare side effect, but you can see some of these other diversity of uh, side effects. Thyroiditis, like it affects your thyroid, affects your adrenal. This is what I was referred to. Oftentimes we have an endocrinologist involved in the care. Colitis, skin rash, pneumonitis, hepatitis. So you can see here that there, even though it has what's referred to as a safer um, uh, 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 adverse event profile compared to some of our traditional chemotherapeutics, it does come with some serious, although uncommon, and we refer to these toxicities usually from a grade one through five with one and two being manageable, and we're really excited about grades three and four, where we oftentimes will integrate drug therapy to, to assist in the treatment of these side effects. So I think one of the, the key things for patients who are taking these type of agents is to track your symptoms, specifically like sort of minor things you would think about like energy level. Oftentimes this could be a, a significant sort of involvement of the endocrine system, particularly thyroid. It's not uncommon that patients will have uh, thyroid supplementation within the first several weeks of therapy, um, and oftentimes patients feel very fatigued. Something like a new cough that you would think would be very benign, this may be a, a sign of a patient developing pneumonitis, which is a, a significant uh, immune-related adverse event that we oftentimes treat. Have I seen any changes in bowel movement? That's simple, like I've had diarrhea for a couple of days. Um, don't dis dismiss that as something that is just common. Uh, this could be leading to the development of something called colitis, and of course, rashes oftentimes get our attention. And usually, from an immune-related adverse event standpoint, the rash is one of their earlier adverse events or side effects we see. Here on the bottom of the screen here, you'll see sort of a treatment paradigm, and, and you'll see here right here on this slide that oftentimes if these, uh, these events happen and they are of a, a certain significance, particularly like grade two, grade three, we start treating with corticosteroids and primarily prednisone has been sort of our, our, our steroid of choice. 
And oftentimes patients are getting steroids and we try to tape those off within, um, depending upon the, the, the patient's response to the steroids, we try to tape those off within a three to four week window. What you're seeing here on the right side of the screen, this is an ONS, uh, so the Oncology Nursing Society, they have these immunotherapy wallet cards that are oftentimes dispensed to patients. It's not uncommon for patients to present to their uh, local ER, and oftentimes the ER physicians are not as uh, uh, apt to be able to treat some of our immune-related adverse events that are there. So this is sort of like a, a mechanism to say, hey, I'm on an immunotherapy agent, and uh, you know this should raise concerns as it relates to potentially initiating steroids. So just because of time constraints for today's talk, I really wanted to provide some other sort of good reads, particularly in the setting of immunotherapy related adverse events. And I think there's some excellent ones on the, mar on the uh, internet currently. Uh, I know CITSI, so the Society of Immunotherapy and Cancer, they have a, a good patient resource that's on their website that's free. The NCCN also has uh, immunotherapy side effects for patients. Uh, and, and these are readily available online if you have an interest or have had um, um, uh, adverse events associated with these agents. I've, I'm familiar with a, a group called Hematology Oncology Pharmacists Association. We had a, a series called Time to Talk Immuno-Oncology, and this was a, 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 we'd received a grant from the, the companies you see here on the screen as it relates to creating patient-friendly educational materials, as well as symptom tracking. So we have that for only, not only PD-1, but also CAR T-cell therapies for um, just for, for other situations. So clearly, we do have drug targets as it relates to targeting uh, uh, your uh, cancer. Um, and for the most part, most of these agents have been targeting something here in the middle of this screen. And this is a complex slide, but I just wanted to say we do have targets and we have a, a variety of agents which have been looked at uh, in, in treating or downregulating these signaling cascades. Clearly, the one that's been looked at the most is vascular endothelial growth factor. And this is uh, what the, the drug bezosivimab uh, or uh, Avastin brand name. Uh, will, will, will inhibit, but you can see some of these other drugs we're going to talk about here momentarily hit some of these other cascades, um, and, and that should be noted. So clearly there are drugs which have been uh, shown to be effective um, in, in this setting. So bezacivimab was originally approved in the setting of colorectal cancer. This is a drug we have a, a, a wealth of knowledge on as it relates to some of its side effects that are associated. These are the warnings and precautions that are seen in their FD label. And um, just for time constraints, you know, you're going to see a recurring themes because some of these agents target VEGF as a as drug target, that some of these drugs that I'll talk about have a very similar side effect profile. So you can see here this drug's associated with gastrointestinal perforations, um, wound healing complications, bleeding, blood clots, high blood pressure, and then finding protein in the urine. So these are, are very uh, common side effects with this class in general. Now, specifically for hypertension, I think this is one that becomes a, a very large challenge for a lot of us, particularly for those patients which have high blood pressure to begin with when they start uh, these treatments. Um, starting with this one, I would just say from a management of hypertension, I mean, close monitoring of blood pressure, particularly earlier as you start these agents, um, is recommended. It always helps us from a clinician standpoint for a patient to come in with uh, a good history and if they can document the readings, particularly as it relates to if they're already on antihypertensive medications to begin with, um, either once a day or twice a day and sort of how the blood pressure changes according to um, the, their drug therapy, this helps us. Obviously the goal was about one, less than 140 over 90 is the goal, but it, but it is not uncommon to see patients struggle to achieve uh, this goal. Uh, I think one of the mechanisms to improve this, is, of course, is to communicate with healthcare professionals, not only your oncology team, but also your primary care physicians who are also oftentimes engaged in that initial um, uh, blood pressure management strategies. There is an emerging field of, of therapies called cardio-oncology. For more refractory patients, oftentimes you may get a cardio-oncology consult. And of course, I think that oftentimes they will provide uh, good insight into the management of this, uh, uh, this adverse event. There hasn't been a blood pressure medicine that I'm aware of that's been shown more effective, but traditionally ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and even um, um, ARBs or angiotensin receptor blockers are most oftentimes utilized, um, but it, it is not uncommon for uh, it, the addition of blood pressure medicines to occur uh, once a patient provide, or presents with elevated blood pressure. 
The next class I'm going to really just briefly go over, and Dr. Abu Afa just covered this, is the two drugs that have been really mainstays for some time, and this would be serafinib and regorafinib. These are multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and um, they're associated with, you know, once again, so some FDA selected warnings in their label, um, hepatotoxicity that I'll talk about on the next slide, infection, hemorrhage, GI perforation, but really the dermatological toxicities are really problematic for some patients. And you can see here on the slide, um, the, the, in the setting of, uh, 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 of having hand foot syndrome or hand foot skin reaction. And you can see the picture here as it relates to what this looks like. I think one of the key management strategies you'll hear from your prescribers is the, the ability to keep moisturized as much as possible. Try to avoid those hot baths, try to avoid dry skin. But as you can see here, it's, it's multifactorial in the fact of trying to control calluses in your, on your skin, oftentimes trying to avoid any sort of friction, particularly on your heat or friction on your, both your feet and your hands. The use of a variety of creams and moisturizers are recommended. If a patient were experiencing one of these grade two, grade three reactions, sometimes topical corticosteroids, particularly clobetazole is oftentimes utilized. So these are really effective strategies to prevent or to manage these hand foot skin reactions that can also that traditionally happen around 50% of patients, if not more. So I did mention regorafenib just on the last slide, and this is a drug which has a black box warning and it's FDA label for hepatotoxicity. I just wanted to state this is a rare event. And if you look in the phase three resource trial, which regorafenib was looked at for patients with liver cancer, there was no increase compared to placebo. Uh, but I just wanted to list that in case you uh, have looked, or if you're on this medication, you see that the FDA labeled. For these reasons, it has monitoring recommendations as it relates to uh, uh, looking at liver function tests pretty frequently, so at least every two weeks during the first two months of treatments, and thereafter as clinical as indicated. For those who haven't experienced a, an elevated test, they do sort of uh, require, or require uh, you to monitor weekly until uh, less than three times upper limit of normal baseline. And in these certain, certain situations, it, it may oftentimes lead to a dose hold and uh, dose reductions if uh, possible. Now, cabozantinib is another drug that Dr. Abu Alpha just discussed, and it sounds like he has a very favorable uh, history with this drug. And uh, I would have listed here is the adverse events associated or found in their celestial phase three study in this patient population. You can see here, once again, a very similar side effect profile as it relates to the, the presence of diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, fatigue, Note the hypertension was grade three, I found about 16% of patients. So, you know, once again, a very similar profile. Uh, cabozantinib not only inhibits uh, VEGF, but also some other uh, kinases which are involved in uh, this uh, cancer etiology. Note here at the bottom, this is a little bit different where it uh, does lead to some decrease in platelets. So it's something we refer to as thrombocytopenia. But it should be noted that, that you know, this is a very effective once a day drug. And uh, usually it's taken on an empty stomach, so either one hour before or two hours after a meal. Two side effects of note in their, ad, in their uh, uh, package insert, if you want to look at this, is hypophosphatemia or low phosphate levels and hypocalcemia, so low calcium. And another sort of interesting sort of caveat with this drug is it's been associated with the development of, of, of osteonecrosis of the jaw, which usually we think about a drug class called bisphosphonates. So for these reasons, they suggest not taking this drug three weeks before a surgical procedure, including dental procedures. And that, that's a little bit of something of, of, of difference with this agent compared to some of the others. And I'm stuck again, there we go. So the, the next drug I'm gonna talk about is lymvatinib. And you can see here comes these, these packs. Uh, interesting thing with this drug is that it, it's based, their dose is based upon your weight. So if a patient weighs 60 kilograms or more, you get the 12 milligram a day dose. If you're less than 60 kilograms, it's recommended to get the eight milligram daily dose. So once again, an oral drug with a very similar side effect profile, you can see here some of the, some of the adverse events we've just recently talked about. This is an interesting slide looking at a recent review paper that was published this year, looking at lovatinib associated adverse events and looking at timing. You can see here from the x-axis median time to for occurrence, the larger the um, circle, it means more prevalent the toxicity. So you can see here one of the first toxicities that you may have with this drug is the development of increased blood pressure, which we've talked about. But as you can see here, this, this blood pressure change is usually found within the first month. And then also you can see here the development of hand foot syndrome, the development of protein in your, in your urine as well as hepatotoxicity. So look out for these toxicities early within the first four to six weeks of therapy. Um, 
a broader looking at, you know, how you should monitor yourself during these treatments. Uh, this is fairly standard and fairly recommended as it relates to looking at LFTs uh, at baseline and then and periodically after looking at thyroid uh, because some of these agents are associated with hypothyroidism. Uh, traditional CBC and, or, and BMP are oftentimes looked at, but note down here the development or how much you should monitor blood pressure, at least early in therapy, and then we can back off later as we can control your blood pressure. So, you know, definitely a lot of monitoring with a lot of these uh, either multi-tyrosine kinase inhibitors, as well as uh, your immune therapy agents. Particularly some of the oral drugs like regorafenib, cabozantinib, and lovatinib, uh, as you would imagine, these drugs are associated potentially with some uh, other drug interactions, and they are. Uh, you may have heard that uh, some drugs have an issue with, uh, have a drug interaction with grapefruit juice or grapefruits. And with Rego and cabozantinib, these drugs do have that as a food drug interaction. Uh, from Rego and Cabo, these drugs do have drug interactions with strong CYP3, 4 inhibitors and inducers. And, as, and for the setting of Regorafenib, it also has an interaction with BCRP substrates. Now you're probably thinking, okay, I have a fairly lengthy medication profile. You know, do I have any active drug interactions with these agents. And, and clearly, I think this is something you should monitor and have all parties engaged. Um, traditionally, most specialty pharmacies will, will, will have a, a medication reconciliation process with you to, um, to quickly identify any drug interactions. But if you were to have any drug, and this could be like a one to two week course of a, an antibiotic, for example, this needs to be relayed to the individuals involved in your cancer care to basically mitigate some of these drug interactions. And then for lumvatinib, you see here some certain drugs which have a QT uh, interval prolongation uh, uh, capability. These need to be avoided while taking lumvatinib. Ramucirumab, this is the uh, IV drug that was mentioned earlier. It does have an indication where it has a requirement that a patient has an alpha fetal protein level of greater than 400 and has been treated with serafinib. This is a drug we've used for some time in the, as well as in the setting of colon cancer as well as lung cancer. And you can see here, this is an IV drug every two weeks and it does have a similar warning and precaution um, that we just discussed uh, with some of these other agents. Lastly, one of the things I wanted to talk about, one of the real challenges for toxicity mitigation for cancer patients is the, what, we, what's the, what we've deemed the term the financial toxicity. Uh, many of these agents have very high co-pays, and I think this is where, you know, if, if, if you're having difficulties uh, meeting the challenges of the financial component of, 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 for these medications, uh, seek the help of, at your institutional level with financial navigators. Uh, pharma has been very good as, as relating to patient assistance programs. And uh, I think I would be remiss to do a talk with a lot of uh, med medications and not mention this whole issue with financial toxicity. But definitely there's individuals involved in your care and uh, they, they can get more engaged in this process to help you mitigate these. Lastly, since we've talked about a lot about sort of the drugs that are currently on the market, I would say, uh, you know, what is on the horizon? Clearly there's an emergence of gene therapy that is being looked at. Uh, we're continuing to see more immunotherapy, particularly combinations I've really just listed, uh, you know, some of the immunotherapy agents that are FDA labeled, but clearly there continues to be more combo drugs, which be or which are being looked at. And then lastly, if you've heard something called CAR T cell therapy, then they've you know had success, particularly in the hematological setting, with drugs with uh, diseases like uh, like leukemias, lymphomas, and now multiple myeloma. We are entering the stage now where solid tumors like HCC are being looked at with this kind of technology? And uh, is there ways we can have CAR-T being a, an effective therapy for patients with solid tumors? The one which is being looked at the most with the, probably the best success that I could find is something called GPC-3. One of the challenges with most solid tumor CAR-T cell therapies is that you, know, you have to find an identifiable target that's not expressed in normal cells. So GPC-3 is not expressed in hepatocytes. And that's one of the reasons why this is being chosen. So if you're looking for potential on the horizon therapies, I would say maybe CAR-T for uh, a various uh, a target. Lastly, um, you know, this, uh, from a conclusion perspective, the, hopefully you've seen that uh, you know, there are options both in a first and second line therapy. I work in clinical trials. We, uh, we uh, target oftentimes patients with HCC to try to get them on a clinical trial if we can, uh, but second line treatment is very dependent on patient specific factors, including tolerance, uh, 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 compliance as well as tumor biomarkers. 
And lastly, the, 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 probably the, uh, the recommendation I can give you the most is really utilize your multidisciplinary team involved in your care, specifically as it relates to some of the challenges uh, with, with financial toxicity, coordination of care, uh, and then uh, oftentimes the, the tolerance of these medications. I think that will be your uh, uh, best success in sort of mitigating some of the challenges of, uh, of these, these uh, medications I've discussed. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'll join the panel here for any questions. Thank you so much. We will now open it up to uh, the panel for questions and Dr. Shield will um, oversee this. We ask Dr. Abu Alpha and Dr. Guy to turn their cameras on. Hi, this is Sheila S. Warren. I'm one of the hepatologists at Rush Medical Center. Um, great talks, great way to start the conference, great overviews about uh, liver cancer in general, how we pre can prevent liver cancer screening, treatment, and uh, more specifics about the um, systemic chemotherapies that we have. To, we have a lot of great questions. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, uh, don't worry. Um, there is a mechanism. We will collect any unanswered questions and be able to email uh, the answers to you. So if we don't get to all the questions, uh, rest assured, you are being heard. One really good question for Dr. Taddy. Is she on here? She had to say that again for the panel for the panel in general what what um what are some of the symptoms of liver cancer dr alba alpha do you want to do that one uh sure i think it's from the uh medical oncology standpoint um and no doubt that many times or sometimes patients might not have symptoms and they present only because of some screening process or some other reason why we're doing an evaluation of one kind or the other. But however, uh, some of the classic symptoms, if they were to happen, uh, include uh, pain in the abdomen, especially in the right upper quadrant. Uh, in addition to that, uh, patients, uh, if they have any potential uh, discomfort with eating, i.e. they feel fullness very early, can occur as well. Uh, and understandably, some of the symptoms I'm going to describe, they really talk about very advanced stages of liver cancer, which to be fair, we hope we're not there with any of the patients. None of them are ignoring those symptoms. Like if somebody has yellow eyes, dark urine, uh, fluid collection in the belly, like look very pregnant like um, belly, uh, swollen the legs. Uh, sometimes confusion, spacing out, forgetfulness. These are really more advanced case, uh, uh, situation of liver dysfunction, which we hope that we're going to see. Uh, if anything, we hope that all the patients will come to the care for liver cancer based on a screening that, as we said, and we are encouraging to make sure people will get. Very good. We have another question from the audience for Dr. Guy who mentioned that there were some medications to treat underlying conditions. Um, is there a liver specific medication to help slow the progression of cirrhosis? That is an excellent question. And the scientific community is working very hard on finding a medication that could do that. They are called antifibrotics, so to decrease scarring, but we are not quite there yet, but there are many clinical trials. Uh, and so it's really good to continue to ask your doctor about that because I anticipate we will have some soon. And it's important to treat the underlying liver disease. I think you highlighted that in terms of fatty liver, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. There was a comment and a question from the audience about a cure for hepatitis B. So I saw that question. Thank you for putting it into the chat. Um, so hepatitis C, as compared to hepatitis B, hepatitis C has a cure. Medications are able to cure hepatitis C, which is an RNA virus. Hepatitis B is a DNA virus. And so we are at present not able to cure hepatitis B because the DNA, as I had mentioned, can get into our cells and then it's harder to actually cure it. For hepatitis B, we have medicines that can control hepatitis B by decreasing and eliminating viral replication of the hepatitis B, therefore eliminating inflammation and scarring. But again, scientific uh, research is really helping us to understand how we might be able to cure hepatitis B in the future. So also something to be kind of keeping tabs on with your physicians because we can't cure hepatitis B yet 
but we hope we'll be able to do so in the future. Thank you. Um, it's nice to hear from Dr. Abu Alpha that there are so many different treatment options. One question for the from the audience is how will treatment affect my daily life? Uh, will I be able to work, exercise, and perform my usual activities? Oh, thanks so much, Dr. Roa. Actually, if anything, I'll tell you, I have a good answer for that one, which is great. Please remember, this is not chemotherapy. These are actually mainly driven by immunotherapy and biologic drugs. And if I were to say jokingly, the best side effects is that I'm really begging patients to come to clinic because they're all busy traveling and vacationing and doing what they like to do. So that's very important to remember that 95% of patients on immunotherapy will not even get any symptoms. It can happen that some of them will have joint pains. They can have uh, some rashes. They can have some diarrhea, but always manageable and will be able, as we heard from Dr. Deramer, will be able to control those enough that people can have the regular functionality back to where it should be. Some of the biologic drugs can have a little bit of more kind of, you know, how to say, well-stated uh, symptoms like weight loss. And uh, add to this, maybe the hands can have, be affected with some peeling of the skin. But again, usually management. And always, if I were to uh, say anything, please, please, I urge the patients, don't wait like and keep going on a drug, let's say if it's a pill, until you see the doctor, call the doctor, explain to them what's going on. They will be able to help you uh, to really keep the functionality. Because after all, our success in all those cares is making sure that patients are able to lead with their life normally. Otherwise, we really did not do a good job in that regard. And that's why I start by saying, I'm beyond delighted to really be able to see some of the therapies are happening even on every three to four weeks basis and patients are able to go on their holidays and uh, be with families uh, in between so uh, i would say thankfully people can have a manageable daily life as if they really don't have the cancer to begin with thank you i was gonna say to that, that the person living in florida i think that one of the challenging adverse events for us is particularly the hand foot syndrome if you have a patient who's very active and they like to run, it, it becomes really challenging when they try to mitigate some of the challenges with friction, both on their hands and their feet, particularly their feet in the hot Florida sun. It's hand foot is something that's difficult to deal with, particularly in the South. And there are strategies for the, the rash that occurs on the hands and the feet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's, there's ways to try to control it, but it is one of the ones as it relates to people who are very active to try to control those symptoms. Uh, for you, Dr. DeRemer, um, there was a question from the audience uh, about how to sort of keep track. Do you have any advice uh, for patients and family members to keep track of their medications? You had mentioned the immunotherapy cards that you can keep track of uh, the medications you're on. You had mentioned some drug drug or medication interactions it's important for patients and families how do you recommend for your patients to keep track of those um you know with some of our younger patients of course with some of our younger patients who are more apt to like if, if they want to participate in telemedicine then oftentimes they're active on their phone and they like some of the apps there are some compliance apps so for particularly from adherence perspective there is some, some nice apps that they can download on their cell phone to basically have some of their data reporting as it relates to their, their compliance. Um, from some of the, from the immunotherapy perspective, I know there's some companies that have like a tracking of your document or tracking of your adverse events. And I mentioned the, a couple there on the slide. The one that we, we used for HOPA, there's, the, there's some, it's basically a calendar method and you can list your side effects. And if you should start to have an early rash, you can track your thyroid changes those are sort of more you know, PDF type documents that they can download and basically create those type things. But I think those type things really help healthcare professionals when they come in, they have a, particularly as it relates to the hypertension, some of the adverse events we talked about, sort of getting a, a handle and sort of when these things are occurring in relationship to their treatment. Very good. Those are helpful tips. And I think we have time for one, uh, one more uh, question, uh, maybe for Dr. Guy. Um, one individual had a liver transplant in 2020. Prior to transplant, um, uh, procedures were done to eliminate the tumors. Uh, what is the recommendation for surveillance after, I guess, after any treatment? If a patient has liver transplant or lo local regional therapy, systemic chemotherapy, how are we continuing 
to uh, sur do surveillance to follow up after a cancer treatment? That's a great question. So let's start before transplant. So if a patient, for example, is undergoing local regional therapy with a chemoembolization or an ablation, we often check with a multi-phase CT scanner MRI four or six weeks later to see if there's been full treatment response. If there's been full treatment response with no active cancer, then we move to an interval of every three months, usually for the first two years. And thereafter, if there's been no recurrence, we can extend that interval to every six months. Um, if, for example, a patient has undergone liver transplant, at our center and many centers, we use something called the retreat score, which is looking at the risk factors for recurrence after transplant, thinking about what was your alpha fetal protein level at the time of transplant, what did the explant, meaning when we took the liver out and it looked for cancer, was there any active cancer there? If so, were there any high risk features of that? We give people a score and based on their score of high risk features for recurrence, we determine the interval of surveillance. But in general, oftentimes what we're recommending is for someone who may have some risk factors every six month, um, MRI of the abdomen or CT scan of the abdomen, CT scan of the chest and alpha beta protein. But again, this is something to talk to your transplant program about to say, hey, what was my retreat score? How do I need surveillance? Because there are some people post-transplant who have such a low score that they don't require surveillance. Great, thank you so much. Thanks to all the presenters. There are so many more great questions in the question and answer section. Um, so um, I'm afraid we just don't have enough time to get through all of them, but um, they will be uh, filtered and uh, responded to uh, through um, the American Liver Foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great information and a perfect first uh, half of our program. I would like to now welcome Dr. Bowman. She is a health scientist in the Division of Cancer Prevention and Controls Comprehensive Cancer Control Branch Scientific Support and Clinical Translation Team. <laughs> she currently serves as co-lead of the Vaccine Preventable Work Group on the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Partnership, in which CDC serves as one of 19 national organizations whose purpose is to support and provide strategic direction to the Comprehensive Cancer Control Coalition. Welcome. Thank you, Ivory. Can you see my slides? One. Yes. Well, thank you to the American Liver Foundation for inviting me to provide the CDC update on our liver cancer prevention and control initiatives. Since, since 1998, CDC has funded the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Today, we fund 50 states, DC, uh, as well as eight Pacific Island jurisdictions, as you can see on this map, and seven tribes or tribal organizations. The goal of the national program is to fund, uh, provide guidance, as well as technical uh, assistance and support to these programs to design and implement strategic, impactful, and sustainable uh, cancer prevention and control plans. Our key priorities are included here in this slide, and you can see at the top, you see the three, what we call core priorities. The first one is to emphasize primary prevention of cancer. And our work in this space includes increasing vaccinations of HBV as well as HPV, um, promoting tobacco-free living, promoting sun safety, as well as improving nutrition uh, and physical activity. You know, Dr. Guy mentioned the importance of, of that. Uh, our second core, priorities to support the early detection and treatment. And our work in this space is to, uh, pr to, to promote our recommended screenings. And Dr. Guy also um, touched a little bit on that and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. Uh, support, support the appropriate uh, treatment and uh, financial barriers for our patients as well as improve access to clinical trials. Uh, use patient navigators as well as community health workers uh, to, to um, provide the required services, uh, medical and social services to patients. And then the third here is to address the public health needs of uh, cancer survivors. And so we offer survivorship programs as well as support survivors um, uh, care plans as well. Now, my role as a health scientist in our division is to lead the, the division's liver cancer prevention work. And I work very closely with the epidemiologist and the health scientist in the in CDC's division um, of viral hepatitis as well. As you know, that is a major risk factor. And uh, as you 
can see here on the slide, and, and as Ivory mentioned in my bio, I also co-chair the Vaccine Preventable Cancers Group, uh, which is a priority of the Comprehensive Cancer Control National Partnership, of which CDC is one of 19 national partners. And we really, uh, our goal here is to provide strategic direction, uh, as well as support to our coalitions on the ground that are working with our programs and are the backbone to a lot of the interventions um, that are implemented by our program. So translational research, so putting the evidence base and the promising practices of what we know works in the field translating that into the field, working with communities that are disproportionately affected by this disease is um, uh, critical to our work. Prior, um, prior, let's see, in 2019, we, prior to 2019, the vaccine for mental cancers was primarily focused on HPV. And I was asked to serve as co-chair to expand the focus of the work and to incorporate HPV. So now it is uh, a priority of this partnership and I'm, I'm happy to see that change. So CDC's work in liver cancer prevention began in, in 2010 and um, myself along with um, my colleagues in the Division of Viral Hepatitis published uh, our MMWR, what we call the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Um, and this was looking at population-based estimates. So looking at data from 2001 to 2006. Um, hepatocellular car carcinoma, and this is primary liver cancer. And we, we published the data and our findings show there was a continued increase in hepatocellular carcinoma incidence. We also observed 11 states that had significant increases in their incidence rates. And then we also observed these specific communities that were disproportionately affected. So Asian Pacific Islanders have were, were disproportionately affected, Blacks as well as American Indian and Alaskan Natives. Now that same year in 2010, the National Academies, it's formerly the Institute of Medicine, released a national strategy for the prevention and control of hepatitis B and C. And so they included these four areas where they provided recommendations that um, federal agencies, including the CDC, should be engaged in to help prevent um, the disease. And so the first is surveillance. And not, this is not just active targeted surveillance, but also evaluation of our surveillance systems. The second was to um, support outreach and educational pro programs to really raise awareness of the knowledge, um, awareness of, and knowledge of hepatitis B and C virus infections. And then the third was um, to promote vaccinations, the hepatitis B vaccination. And then the fourth was to improve our delivery of viral hepatitis services. And in this space that includes um, providing the resources for the expansion of community-based programs that offer screening and vaccinations, medical management, as well as access to our sterile, uh, to sterile needle syringes. So in 2010 and, and 2015, we spearheaded a review of our cancer plans. Um, and, and so this is where we wanted, I really wanted to look into our cancer plans from the programs, the funded programs to see if we can identify what goals, what strategies and activities that they were engaged in related to liver cancer prevention. And what we found was that most of the cancer plans did not address this connection between chronic HBV or HCV infections and liver cancer. And very few plans actually mentioned any type of prevention activities to reduce the burden of liver cancer. There were states that had these larger Asian Pacific Islander populations that were more commonly reporting addressing HCC, and then some plans targeted specific populations like the American Indian Alaska Native. In 2015, to supplement the, the review, what we decided to do was take a look at the published literature to identify what were these additional liver cancer prevention strategies um, that can potentially be implemented in our national program and, and have support from our coalitions. And these strategies were then organized into the 2010 uh, National Academies report that I mentioned those four areas and we, we published this information in Cancer Causes and Control. So at the time I, I show I mentioned the 2001 to 2006 MMWR and in 2017 we have the, the United States Cancer Statistics Data Visual, Visualization Tool we looked at the data from, 2000, uh, from 2006 to 2015. And you can see here, when you look at this data, when you compare it, well, first you can look at on the left side, you can see that figure, all types of cancer, when you look at the data, they were on the decline. But when you specifically look at liver cancer, from 2006 to 2015, we saw an, the incidence increased by 32% and the death rates increased by, by 25%. And so what we knew here 
Well, one, that was a problem. And what we knew is that liver cancer is preventable. Globally, approximately 78% of hepatocellular carcinoma has been attributable to chronic HBV or HCV infection. What we also knew at this time was in the, in the US, 66% and 39% of people that were infected with hepatitis B and uh, hepatitis C were actually unaware of their infection. And at the time we knew 2.4 million Americans were living with hepatitis C. The prevalence of hepatitis C was highest among the baby boomer population and about 2 million Americans were living at the time with hepatitis B. But we knew that we had these tools, we knew we have the knowledge, and that is that vaccination and screening for viral hepatitis were key to prevention and early detection of liver cancer. And so those reports, the data, really served as our blueprint for our first demonstration project. And what I wanna share here is the critical need for partnerships. So CDC relies on partners. We rely on our programs and their coalitions to support the work that we do. So we onboarded the Cherokee Nation Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, as well as the Idaho Comprehensive Cancer Control Program. Idaho partnered with their immunization bureau because at the time they were seeing a decrease in vaccination rates of hepatitis B and they were concerned about that. Cherokee was dealing with uh, hepatitis C and they have the, the Cherokee Nation um, Health Services along with the hepatitis C uh, uh, elimination program that's led by Dr. Jorge Nero, who's a liver specialist. And so we worked with both of these programs to implement several interventions in those communities. And I don't have the time to go into the details, but I'm just sharing here um, at the bottom, you can see where the papers are published. We published the Idaho work with um, the Journal of Health Promotion Practice and the work with Cherokee in um, the Journal of Preventing Chronic Disease. But the goal here I can share is that we were trying to improve the knowledge and awareness of um, of, of the risk factor and the disease with the healthcare, the healthcare providers, the community coalitions, as well as the patient community. Um, and and the, the second goal would be to, to take and learn from the best practices, lessons learned, and scale it up to our other programs. So we're just working with two programs, but how can we scale and work with those populations of focus? A result of that first demonstration project was this development of an action plan. And this is where we were um, also in touch with our programs and listening to them. What the challenges that they were also dealing with was how do we do this? How do we, we, we have the data, we have these strategies, how do you put it into action? And so we developed this action plan um, in hopes that they would have a resource to then implement those interventions in their communities. Now at this time, and this is prior to the pandemic um, in, in 20, we, we, it, prior to the pandemic and, and before the launch of the second CDC demonstration project that I'll talk about prior to 2019, we also were dealing with uh, the opioid epidemic in this country. And so you can see from this data from 2004 to 2014, hepatitis C and the opioid injection ro uh, rose dramatically in younger Americans. So among people in this age bracket of 18 to 29, HCV increased by 400% and admission for opioid injection by 622%. In the next age bracket, when you look at people aged 30 to 39, HCV increased by 325% and admission for opioid injection by 83%. So this data, this information served as the blueprint to our second demonstration project, which occurred from 2019 to, current, our, to present day. We just wrapped the project and are currently um, compiling the, the, the data and hope to publish the findings. It's actually been accepted to a journal. We're just in the process of, um, of publishing and I'm happy to share that information when the time comes. But uh, four programs that we did on board was the American Indian Cancer Foundation, Iowa Department of Public Health, West Virginia's Department of Health and Human Resources, and then Mississippi State Department of Health. Despite the challenges that the pandemic brought on us, we were they were committed um, to this work. And I just wanted to provide some examples of some of the evidence-based or promising liver cancer prevention strategies that they were engaged in. So one would be to improve access to HBV vaccination. So really focusing on expanding access to free vaccinations in pharmacies and other easily accessible settings, um, community health settings and other community-based settings. I do wanna share that in this year in April, um, CDC, and if you have not viewed these guidelines, CDC published 
some um, updated guidelines that can be um, re viewed on our website. And I'm happy to share this with the American Liver Foundation if there's any easily accessible to package it together to, to, so you can read the updated guidelines that were shared. Um, and the second here, the second bullet talks about using patient navigation for, for treatment, medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder and treatment for hepatitis. So really looking at patient navigators as, as a strategic approach where the nurses and the patient navigators can work directly with this population of focus, the opioid users, to link them to treatment. Implementing targeted naloxone distribution. Um, this strategy also served as a channel for us to educate people who inject drugs about this connection between opioids, hepatitis, and liver cancer, and even provide an opportunity to connect with them on the vaccination and, and screening services that were available in their community. Educating communities, patients, and providers regarding the link between the, the opioid crisis and the um, hepatitis and liver cancer. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit in the next slide about about specific activities around this, improving the delivery of viral hepatitis services. As you can see, these are all examples that fall under the National Academy's report of the type of interventions that we should be engaged in. So ensuring that all adults receive an HCV test at least once in their lifetime. CDC guidelines um, were updated for universal, calling for universal testing in adults, and this is in 2020. And again, you can visit our website to read um, those updated guidelines. Um, encouraging providers to identify patients at risk for HPV and HCV and then assess for those risk factors and test according to those guidelines. Using the National uh, Notifiable Disease Surveillance System data to improve opioid prescribing and treatment of hepatitis services. Um, surveillance, sy the surveillance system and, and our data is core to what we do at CDC, uh, at CDC because it um, informs, you know, uh, it informs or allows us to look at trends, informs patterns of care, and even be able to, for us to be able to look at what the burden is in the community. Implementing comprehensive syringe services. So this is where we're um, hoping to provide additional social medical services, such as um, the safe disposal uh, and of syringes and needles, um, providing education, um, linking to treatment, as well as um, any tools to prevent the infection, such as you know, vaccinations and counseling. Linking to treatment is, is also critical and has been discussed by um, our health departments and some of their partners on ensuring that that does occur. So I talked a little bit at a high level, some of the examples of those evidence-based interventions or promising practices, and I'll just very briefly provide some activities. So I mentioned provider education. And so Project ECHO is a, a project that was launched by a clinician in New Mexico or founded by a clinician in New Mexico. And so what we did was we worked with um, Cherokee Nation, uh, Dr. Mira, who already had a platform in place where he is a liver specialist and he was um, delivering these didactics to um, primary care physicians in rural areas. And so it was a tele, it's a virtual platform where we incorporated some educational uh, messaging and, and information around liver cancer prevention, signs, symptoms, how to diagnose what the sort of, you know, epidemiology was. Um, and we, we, we held about uh, eight or nine uh, sessions of over a course of six months and assessed pre and post um, improvement of knowledge and awareness and also the, uh, the provider's ability to speak with their patients um, around it and feel more comfortable around addressing those questions. Um, a, another example is hosting webinars that would offer these providers CME credits. Around patient education, it's conducting educational sessions. So again, we have our programs, we'll partner with a clinician with the public health department and to raise awareness on the knowledge and the awareness of the risk factors and the disease to the disease and uh, um, the ability and the attention for patients to talk with their provider, know if they're at high risk and then get screened and vaccinated if, if recommended. Um, Idaho actually put out a, a social media campaign on HBV vaccination and also came to know that there's an, a large anti-vax group within the state and there were some challenges that they had to navigate and some messaging that we had to step in to help them with. And so another example of how just a campaign, mass media campaigns or social media campaigns can help, um, but there are some challenges and and barriers um, around disinformation and, and, and misinformation as well. Improving uh, delivery of viral hepatitis services. So this was an opportunity for in a community focused environment with primary care providers who participated in those Project ECHO sessions to actually present cases of HCV positive patients and then seek consultation to determine the appropriate course of treatment. 
And then finally, another um, example of, act of an activity is to implement comprehensive syringe service programs and um, really here is looking to conduct community engagement and outreach and, and distribute harm reduction um, materials. We, we um, also provided, the program provided mobile HPV and HCV screening and medical services during these outreach events. So when I think about moving forward, where we are now and where we wanna go, I think from 2010 um, over these years, really to build on this work, that is our goal. We have received interest from other federal institutions that have um, are aware of our work that want to collaborate with us and, and, and help us scale up um, the work that we're doing. We would like to share our best practices and les lessons learned, hopefully that the other programs would adopt some of these strategies and work with their communities on the ground and focusing on prevention and control. We, of course, stay abreast of these emerging trends like fatty liver disease that's contributing, could be potentially contributing to the increase, increasing incidence, and then focusing on those populations as well. I, I want to end by sharing this slide because yeah, I talked a little bit about you know, data and data from 2001 to 2006. And then again, in the middle of my presentation from 2006 to 2015. But when I pull this data from, uh, from 2015 to 2019, you can see here that there is some type of leveling off. Now, I'm, I can't suggest anything, but something other than that something seems to be working. And so it gives me hope. Um, of course, it's not where we want to see. We want, hopefully want to reverse the trend and bring that down. Um, but we can look at the populations of focus here. We know that men are at a two and a half times increased risk when compared to women, and specifically men in that age group. We've been seeing a, an increase in the Hispanic population in terms of their incidence. Of course, I mentioned earlier, Asian Pacific Islanders, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and Blacks also have a higher incidence. Um, but we really have been looking closely at the Hispanic population, um, which in the data is showing a high incidence, people who inject drugs, and then we're also taking a look at the emerging issues, like I mentioned. Some key takeaways of how to move forward. I mentioned um, that we would like to move forward, but now how do we do it? I just will stress here the critical need for partnerships. As you can see, we work with our partners on the ground to achieve our goal. Resources are extremely crucial for them, especially right now during a time when they're juggling so many different um, issues in the, in, you know, with, the, with the pandemic and other diseases. So resources are cru cru crucial for them, ongoing technical assistance that we provide to them uh, along with the coalitions, and then continued research and demonstration projects to identify the best practices, adoption and dissemination. With that, I, I'd just like to end by thanking again, the American Liver Foundation. I do wanna thank the programs. Uh, I'd like to thank um, the Division of Viral Hepatitis at CDC. And I'd also like to thank ICF who's been a, a great collaborator with us. So thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we will now for our next uh, session, how to navigate clinical trials. We will have a video by our sponsor, Eureka. At Eureka Therapeutics, we understand that every patient is unique and requires personalized treatment. By harnessing the power of one's immune system, we strive to provide safer and more effective T-cell therapies for a wide range of cancer types. We have joined forces with the top cancer institutions, hospitals, and patient advocacy groups to bring our innovative investigational immunotherapies to patients. We are Eureka Therapeutics, and we are committed to partnering with patients to win the fight against cancer. Thank you again to our clinical trial sponsor, Eureka Therapeutics. I'm now excited to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Dana Se Karan. I hope I pronounced that correctly, <laughs> who is an assistant professor in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the School of Medicine, Stanford University. Her clinical practice is mainly focused on liver cancer, and she runs a clinic specifically for patients with liver masses. Welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, th thanks to ALF for this opportunity. Um, it's always, you know, awesome to talk to patients directly. Uh, we don't get too many such opportunities. Sometimes uh, a lot of the talks are just amongst physicians. So this is a really great platform. Um, so thanks for the introduction. I'm Reno. Uh, I'm at Stanford. And I will be talking to you today about navigating clinical trials. Uh, before I jump into my uh, you know, talk a little bit about myself. So I'm uh, currently a basic scientist. My lab at Stanford, we focus on uh, immunology in liver cancer. So it's been a you know, great time with all these new immunotherapy drugs coming in for our patients. And my clinical practice is uh, mostly taking care of patients with liver cancer. I've been doing this for the past few years. So um, I'm really passionate about this research. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to find me, uh, email me, would love to hear directly from patients. So the, my talk, um, there's not a lot of data. Uh, I just want to sort of give a broad outline of uh, clinical trials. So I divided into four parts. The first section will be a very big overview of what are clinical trials. Um, and then I will jump into how and why you, you should participate in clinical trials. I'll very briefly highlight some you know, historic perspective of what's happening in clinical trials for liver cancer. I think my next speaker, Dr. Gretton, will be going into a lot more on the specific uh, drugs and uh, ongoing trials. And then I'll end with uh, some parting thoughts. So let's start with the first section on what are clinical trials. If you look at a definition, which can sort of capture the essence of what a clinical trial is, a clinical trial is a controlled research study. It's conducted by your medical team. The goal is usually to evaluate an intervention and to see if we can improve the care and treatment for patients with different conditions like cancer. Some of these words here are important. This is a controlled research study. So we are really controlling several aspects of this, which I will explain more. There is a whole team of you know, medical and pharmacological uh, team that's involved in this. And our big goal here is to ultimately improve the treatment of patients with cancer and of course, find a cure. I'm a big fan of history. So I look back and see, hey, how did we start all this? How did we come to this definition of this is how we find treatments? This is a story of scurvy. Some of you might have heard of this. Um, it's a you know, very fascinating uh, tale of how uh, this framework was uh, you know, put in place. The picture you see on the left is of the, um, the ship, the HMS Salisbury. Uh, they were out in the English Channel. They used to sail for days. They were patrolling the channel there. And there was a physician, James Lind, who was assigned to be the physician on this ship in the 1750s. And in those days, with you know, conditions that prevailed, there were many illnesses and diseases that sailors would catch on these long uh, you know, ship journeys, um, infections, overcrowding, malnutrition. But there was a particular condition that the sailors were really uh, you know, scared of. It was called scurvy. And here on the right, you see original um, you know, depiction by this physician, Dr. Lind, he wrote down how these sailors were getting oral ulcers, leg blisters, bleeding under the skin, nerve issues in the legs. And he clearly documented, uh, you know, that's the first step, right, to understand the disease. And there were so many factors that could have possibly led to this. So to tease this out, he recruited 12 sailors and he divided them into six groups. Each group had obviously two sailors. And his hypothesis was this was coming from a deficiency of uh, some kind of acid. So he gave different kinds of acid, including sulfuric acid to one group, to each of these six groups. One of the groups just got salt, uh, seawater. One of the groups got ascorbic acid, which is in lemons and oranges. They did not know that it was vitamin C, but they knew it could be ascorbic acid. So one of two of, two of the sailors got lemons and oranges. I think he did it for like two weeks or so, and he saw a dramatic result. Only those two sailors who got uh, the oranges and lemons actually completely improved while all the other 10 sailors did not. So obviously this was sort of, you know, the framework of dividing people into groups, giving different treatments, same time period, comparing them, documenting the improvement. So this is considered the first clinical trial. And this led to sort of the, uh, you know, acknowledgement that vitamin C was involved in scurvy. And right now we, this is all well-established science. So this was sort of the beginning. This was 1750s, we've come a long way. And there are um, you know, hundreds of drugs approved, millions of lives saved through this framework of running clinical trials. 
And I think one of the famous stories, um, one of the famous personalities that you would have heard of is our president, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter was diagnosed with melanoma in 2015. Uh, he initially had melanoma long back in 2002, but in 2015, he had uh, melanoma spread to his liver and his brain. At that time, um, metastatic melanoma was considered uh, pretty uniformly fatal. We didn't have good treatments once the tumor spread to multiple organs. A clinical trial on immunotherapy had just concluded. Um, and so, the, so President Carter was offered this option. Apart from radiation, he was given this immunotherapy drug. And in a matter of uh, weeks, when they did a next scan, they saw that his tumors had begun to shrink and completely disappear. As you all know, uh, Jimmy Carter is uh, 98 now. He celebrated his 98th birthday six days back. So he's alive and doing well. So this is clearly a miracle story. And I think it was uh, front and center in the you know, public because President Carter is a well-known public figure. And so this is how far, I mean, this is an example, but there are so many anecdotes and stories and trials. So this is how far I think the field has come. Um, and this, I would say, is a large part thanks to how we conduct and run clinical trials. Now, there are two major types of clinical trials. One is observational and two is interventional. In the observational, um, they are collecting um, groups like me who do this kind of research. We collect uh, biological samples, clinical data from patients who have conditions, and we observe them over a period of time to understand the disease better. No intervention here is administered. This is more to understand and help patients in the future. And these kind of observational studies are relatively you know, risk-free for patients to participate in, and we would love to see more of this in liver cancer. The second is a more traditional clinical trial, which is interventional. There is a test or a therapy that's administered to see if it is safe and effective. And we'll go a little bit into details on what the phases are, what are clinical trials. So how does a clinical trial work? Very broadly, there are four phases. Easy to remember, one, two, three, four. Um, phase one is the first step. This is when a drug or an intervention has been found to be promising from preclinical, as in, in animal studies. And now we want to test this in human beings because this is the first time it's being tested in humans. Safety is the focus here. You want to make sure this you know, intervention or drug is safe. So a small number of patients, usually in phase one, around 15 to 50 patients, they're administered the drug, different doses. We measure the blood test, the different side effects and we determine if the drug is safe to be studied in larger populations. A lot of drugs do fail at phase one, around 70% usually are safe enough to move on to phase two. So once it passes phase one and the drug comes to phase two, now the focus is effectiveness. Does it work in the case of cancer? Does it shrink the tumor? Does it prevent tumor progression? Does it increase survival of the patients? And the focus here, of course, we also look at side effects. This is a little bit larger. Um, around you know, 15 to 100 patients can participate at this phase. And um, around 33-35% uh, of drugs actually pass from phase two to phase three. But this is a big drop-off point. A lot of drugs that are found safe in preclinical studies and effective may not really work in very complex you know, human systems. So a lot of drugs get weeded out at this phase. Then comes the phase three, which is considered the gold standard uh, for approval for any drug. A phase three is a very large study, usually multiple centers, a lot of times multiple countries. We're gonna compare the new treatment with the existing gold standard treatment. And what we are doing here is we are randomizing patients to receive different kinds of treatment and then comparing them. Hundreds, thousands of patients participate in this. If a drug is found effective in a phase three study, then it goes on for FDA evaluation and then FDA approval, hopefully. Once FDA approves the drug and it's out in clinical practice, now you can imagine hundreds of thousands of people could potentially get the drug. So we continue to monitor for long-term effects. That's the phase four or post-marketing study. So this is the main you know, phases of clinical trials. Now, a lot of patients, my patients who see me in clinic, they are like, oh, wow, this sounds like an experiment. So am I a guinea pig? I mean, it's an elephant in the room. We should address it. And I hope I can convince you that it's most definitely not. And the reasons are clinical trials, like I said, are in very controlled circumstances. Usually cancer patients are not getting placebo arms. They're getting the best current standard of care or a new and more effective therapy. So on either arm, they will be getting the best possible treatment that's available. And clinical trials are watched very closely by doctors. 
you get a lot of attention, a lot of follow-up visits, labs, there's a protocol for this. So you get excellent cancer care when you are part of a trial. And of course, if there are any concerns that the drug is not safe or not working, trials are stopped in the middle. So you don't have to worry that, you know, even if it's not working, they would keep continuing it. And also it's autonomy. You have the option to leave the trial at any time you want. There is no, it's not like you're in this box and you need to stay. So there's a lot of autonomy and patients make decisions based on the information they receive. And we've come a long way from the past when there were some uh, you know, issues with ethics. Right now we have a very strong ethical framework. There's oversight on clinical trials. So I feel confident that you know, patient safety is first and foremost in trials. And I don't want anyone to feel like this is just you know, a, an experiment that people are conducting on them. This is done in a very um, you know, controlled setting. So let's move on to the next section on how to find the clinical trials. The best resource is your doctor. Talk to your doctor, ask them what's available. They may not be aware of every uh, trial in their institution, in their region, but they can definitely refer you to the clinical trial coordinators and team. They have a list of eligibility criteria, a list of trials, and they can talk to you and see which one you might be a good fit for. Ask questions, find out more. There is the NCI has a information service helpline. They have a website. You could also go there for you know, more public resources. There are many financial questions. My patients are usually worried. Is everything covered? Uh, what about out-of-pocket costs? Um, you know, for the most part, the trial sponsors, sponsors the drug, the intervention, the insurance companies will sponsor anything that's standard of care. That's like the doctor visit, the imaging blood test. Um, so usually these are, again, you know, there's a lot of resources to find out more. Um, so if you have questions, you would have to, you know, be more specific to reach out to whoever your, you know, your trial for a financial coordinator is. But in general, between the pharmaceutical companies and the, the institutions and the insurance companies, most of these costs are covered. So um, I'm, I, I had a little few slides on this, but I will make this brief. Um, clinical trials in liver cancer. I think you've been listening to this since this morning. This is five-year survival across the board for all cancers, dramatic improvement from 50% to 67% between 1970 and 2013. But as you can see in liver cancer, we still have a long way to go. It's one of the cancers where five years survival is still below 25%. And so cl clearly we need more trials, more participation from all of you. And mortality for HCC is pretty high. If you're diagnosed early, of course, you know, you have surgical options, but those who are diagnosed late, five year survival remains low, which is why again, um, new drugs are needed. And for systemic therapy, we had this one drug, serafinib, you know, approved in 27, 2007. Between 2007 and 2017, we had so many drug failures. It was so heartbreaking. Um, so many phase three trials were failing, but it's been a blockbuster for the last five years. We've had multiple approvals, both immunotherapy and targeted therapy. I think this has been explained to you, but this is all coming out of multiple clinical trials that I've listed under each drug that was approved. And we are hoping that there will be a lot more coming next. What are we thinking? There's a lot of funding here in the liver cancer market size. You can see the market size in terms of millions of dollars invested has progressively increased from 2016 to 2022, especially in the immunotherapy front. So we hope all this will lead to new combination of targeted therapy and immunotherapy, new immunotherapy targets, combination of local therapy with immunotherapy, and also immunotherapy after treatment to prevent recurrence, which is a big problem in liver cancer. So I would like to end with saying behind every new cure are thousands of brave volunteers who participated in these clinical trials. This is a call to action. We want all of you who are interested to try to find out more and participate. Um, I leave you with a few resources. This is from the Mayo Clinic website. They have links to several places where you can find studies, um, how to find studies, how to match resources, and of course, assistance for billing and financial questions. Thank you very much. Um, that's my email. Feel free to reach out to me. Happy to answer any questions. And thank you to ALF for this opportunity to talk directly to our patients. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Dr. Nina. That was such a great presentation. <laughs> you can actually take pictures <laughs> of the different slides. That was fantastic. Um, before we introduce our next speaker, we're going to take a quick clinical trials poll. Hopefully everyone can see the poll. If you have not been a part of a clinical trial, what barriers have stopped you? And we'll give people about 30 seconds to complete that.
Oh, wonderful. We can all see that. Um, the top is other. Well, oh, equal other. The other is lack of awareness, 42%. I have been a part of a clinical trial, 17%, and tied with transportation, logistics, and the least um, barrier is cost. So that is great to know. Thank you so much for that. Now I'm excited to welcome Dr. Tim Gretton, who is a physician scientist who uses his medical expertise in gastroenterology, hepatology, and medical oncology. He also directs the GI medical oncology clinical team that concludes, conducts clinical trials in patients with GI cancer. Welcome, Dr. Tim. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and um, Thank you, ALF, for doing this. I think this is um, a very, very important um, seminar, you know, uh, that, that we have here. So before I talk, you know, about my topic, let me, you know, let me come back to the uh, introduction, actually. So what is a physician scientist? So, you know, maybe let me just introduce what I'm actually doing. So um, as you heard, I work at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, um, where we basically do basic research. So we're trying to develop in the laboratory novel treatment options for patients with liver cancer. And we are also testing these new ideas and conduct clinical trials. So this is really, um, you know, this really allows me um, to go from very basic questions and then translate these into patients and, and, and develop novel treatments and test those. And at the uh, NIH or the NCI, we, we, we have a unique opportunity to do this. And um, I would like to get back to this poll that we just had. And the unique opportunity that we have is that we can basically treat anybody. There is no costs for our patients. There is no transportation issues. We can fly in patients if they come to our trials. And I think this is you know, quite a unique um, opportunity for patients that I want them to be aware of. Now, you, you just heard from Renu about, you know, the different clinical trials and the different stages. But, you know, what I would like to do is, you know, let's just go one step back from the patient perspective. And the first question obviously is, should I enroll into a clinical trial or not? And when? When is the right time? And this is obviously, you know, a very important question and the answer is, you know, this is something that you have to discuss with your treating physician. There are clinical trials for patients that are just newly diagnosed. Obviously, this, in this case, you would um, discuss the trial before you have even started any type of treatment. But then there is also clinical trials for those patients that have already received one type of treatment and this treatment was maybe not as effective as it should have been, or it was not very well tolerated. So that's another option when you can potentially enroll into a clinical trial. Sometimes I get calls or emails from patients and they ask, you know, maybe, you know, should I enroll into a clinical trial? And, you know, we just discuss this as an option for future treatments in case the current treatment is not applicable or, or, or no longer um, working. So the short answer again, you know, is when is it right time for a clinical trial? You know, it really depends on the patient as well as the type of trial. Now, how do clinical trials actually work? And, you know, the, the idea is, you know, to talk about novel drugs and, you know, what we see in the future. And here I have to tell you, I've been working in this area for way too many years. Um, the field has really dramatically changed. I still remember together with my uh, um, good friend, uh, Dr. Abu Alfa, you know, that we had very few drug options available for patients. And now we actually have a battery of different drugs and this is the result of clinical research and doing clinical trials. So from a broad perspective, when we talk about clinical trials and novel treatment options, what we do right now is always the best. 
And the clinical trials are there to develop novel treatments, which, are, which have to be basically better than what we have right now. So let me explain to you what I mean by this. So current treatment, and you've heard this from the previous speakers, include surgical treatments, they include interventional treatments, and they include systemic treatments and radiation therapy. These are basically the main pillars that we have. And when we talk about systemic treatments, you heard about this, there is um, uh, what we call TKIs or, or um, targeting drugs, and then the growing field of immunotherapy that really has um, brought significant changes to the field and, 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 um, and advanced the field. So when we talk now about novel treatments, the first thing one can do is one can use these novel, these treatments that maybe are only approved for patients with already advanced or metastatic disease. And we can test them in, in other settings, in earlier settings, for instance, in the adjuvant setting, you've heard about adjuvant earlier today. So this is type of a trial where you already use drugs that are approved in HCC, not for a specific tumor stage. And we try to see that something that works maybe in a later tumor stage also works in an earlier tumor stage or for instance, in combination with an already established treatment. The established treatment could be a radiofrequency ablation, or it could be a transarterial chemoembolization or taste procedure, or it could also be radiation treatment. Now, these are treatments or clinical trials which basically use drugs that are already, that have already shown efficacy in HCC and which are already approved by the FDA. Now, the next level of novelty are drugs which have not received FDA approval in HCC. These may be drugs that we use, use in other indications, maybe other to, uh, tumors of the GI tract, and um, such drugs um, do exist and are being uh, studied right now. And the question is that um, a researcher then you know, asks is, could it be that these drugs also are effective in HCC? Now let's get more um, progressive. And those are the studies where we actually test novel drugs which have not received FDA approval. So these drugs are not um, on the market yet. And these drugs are tested in patients with HCC. So how do we do this? So these are basically clinical trials that you offer to patients. Because we don't know how well these drugs work, we always have to keep in mind that we don't withhold a treatment that is effective. So in most cases, these treatments are offered to patients that have already received prior treatment. And we deliver this to patients. And basically the treatment is very similar to what you experience if you have a standard treatment. So you get the treatment, you have scans before and after, and there's a team you know, that asks you how you're doing and they're doing blood tests, et cetera. And we see how well this treatment works. Now, what are these treatments? Currently, the biggest interest is in immunotherapy. Immunotherapy, you've already heard this earlier, is basically a way to activate your immune system. We can do this in many ways. We know that the immune system can be used or can be very effective because if an immune system actually overshoots, there are, are autoimmune diseases, for instance, Crohn's disease, or you may have heard of ulcerative colitis. So we know this can be very um, effective. And the immunotherapies that we use right now are basically treatments that try to enhance T cell responses, T lymphocyte responses that basically kill your tumors. Now the immune system is a very, very complex system in your body. It has to be complex because it prevents you from getting sick or you, when you get infections. If we didn't have a functioning immune system, any infection could potentially be deadly. And you know, I don't want to go there, but you know, we all know from the past two years how dangerous different infections can potentially be. In order for the immune system to be effective, there are various types of the immune cells. There are T cells, but there's also B cells. You may have heard of macrophages. These are basically 
um, cells that eat uh, specific, um, um, uh, basically trash um, in, in the body and, and prevent um, this trash to harm you. And currently there are a number of studies, including of HCC, where we now not only try to activate T lymphocytes, but where we also try to aim at these other cells and make these other cells more effective to basically mount a better immune response. Alternatively, to trials where we use drugs to make your immune cells really fit and destroy tumor cells. There's also the option to actually take the T cells out of your body, genetically engineer them. So we change them in the laboratory, perform kind of a gene therapy in these cells, make these cells fit to kill a tumor cell, we grow them so that we get enough of those cells and then transfuse them back into the patient. And this is an approach that you may have heard. It was already um, briefly mentioned earlier today, which is called a CAR T-cell approach. So this is an approach which is obviously more invasive, but it's actually only a one-time procedure. It will also require that the patient will undergo chemotherapy for three days or two to five days prior to, to the treatment. And it's certainly something which is already way more, I would say, novel and, 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 and um, than treatments using an immune checkpoint inhibitor that we try to improve, for instance. So what I'm trying to tell you with these clinical trials is that it's, it's really, and this is why, you know, it's important to discuss this with the patient and your, your providers and, and, and your family. You know, are you going into a clinical trial that is using already established drugs where we, have no, where we already have more knowledge? Or are we going into something that is more novel and something that, for instance, has never been tested in human? These are the trials that we call the first in human clinical trials. So this is all of a sudden, somebody has a brilliant idea and a good um, data suggesting that you could use a completely novel approach that has never been tested in patients with HCC. What are other treatment options? So you already heard from me now that there are treatment options where we combine immunotherapy with already conventional um, treatments. There are treatments where we make the T cells more active, maybe not only using one drug, but maybe using two drugs and two different type of drugs that aim at the T cells. The next level would be combinations where we, for instance, try to activate the tumor cell and at the same time try to activate or get rid of immune cells that actually inhibit immune responses. The, end, the, the, the body has just naturally actually also immune cells which try to prevent an overreacting immune response. But sometimes these immune cells can actually be not very good for the patients with the cancer because they kind of make your immune response too weak. The next step, as I said, would be instead of using drugs to activate your T cells, to take the T cells out of the body, genetically engineer them, and then bring them back into the body so that they can take the job and kill the tumor cells. The interesting thing is that these T cells are actually obviously cells, so they are living, living cells which remain in your body for a long time and they proliferate. And we know from early studies and in other indications that these cells can actually survive for many, many, many years. 10 years after an infusion, you can still find um, such um, CAR T cells. Now, we can go even further. So there is, a lot of interest in something that we call the gut microbiome. And some of you may have heard about this, and I'm sure many haven't heard about this. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. It is well known that the human body under normal conditions, so this is not under any, this is not a disease, 
is carrying a lot, a lot of bacteria. You have bacteria on your skin, on your face, in your mouth, but you also have it, a lot of bacteria in your GI tract. And these bacteria help you, you need these. If you didn't have any bacteria, for instance, in your GI tract, the immune system would not be working as well as it is. Now, sometimes the compositions of these bacteria is not ideal. And we can potentially change this to make a treatment more effective and make your immune responses that we are trying to induce to kill tumors more effective. So these are um, um, different approaches and you know, without going into the details how this works, but if you really want to say, you know, where do I see the field moving in the next couple of years, this is certainly something of, of um, great interest. Now, last but not least, I want to come back to our standard treatments. And again, you already heard this actually in, in the um, talk just before me, we were talking about observational studies. Now, even in what we call standard treatment or approved treatment. So this is a type of treatment where your uh, oncologist would say, you know, this is the best treatment we have and we know this works best. Unfortunately, we never know if this treatment works in every single patient. We know if we treat enough patients and compare the treatment in one group versus a different treatment or no treatment in another group, we know that the treatment group is doing better. But this is only if we look at the average of all those patients. If we look at every single individual patients, we don't know this. And what we would love to do is we would actually love to have a treatment where we know exactly if we can help every single individual patients with this or not. And that's basically something where we talk about biomarkers. The idea here is that we use different mechanisms. For instance, we look at your biopsy, we look at blood tests, we look at other um, parameters, which will help us to find a personalized approach for every single patient, which would allow us to predict that every single patient is actually responding to a treatment. So why am I mentioning this in this uh, session? Because this is also actually part of a clinical trial. So sometimes you may be uh, asked by your treating physician to enroll into a clinical trial where we collect different types of information. It can be just your clinical information. It can be data from your scans. It can be blood samples. It can be tumor samples. And the reason why this is done is because we are trying to understand the biology of the disease. And most importantly, we're trying actually to identify how specific treatments work and how we can make sure that patients, that really all patients benefit from a treatment. And it's not only the average patient because the problem with the average patient and the approach that we're taking currently is that there are always some patients in between that are being exposed to a treatment with potential side effects and costs who unfortunately don't gain the benefit that we're wishing for. So with this, um, I would like um, to close. I hope I was able to give you a little bit about an idea where the field works. On purpose, I didn't want to confuse you and talk about specific drugs. I think this would be uh, probably too difficult at this point, but more give you a perspective. If there are any questions, I'm happy you know, to answer these in the discussion. If you don't want to do this now, you can always reach me. I work for the NIH, which gives you the advantage. You just have to put my name in Google and you'll find all the information how you can reach me with one click. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now turn it over to Dr. Guy um, for our final Q&A session. Thank you. I just wanted to thank all the speakers for some really thought provoking uh, and really important uh, talks. So thank you so much. We do have some uh, questions in the chat. Uh, and Ivory, uh, Allison's going to stay on too as representative for the American Liver Foundation because there's a great um, question in the chat. 
about the, the idea around the hepatitis B uh, and association with liver cancer and how can we uh, engage the community more in learning about hepatitis B and hepatitis B prevention programs. Uh, it seems like an opportunity for the American Liver Foundation. And so Ivory will talk about that. And then maybe we could also have Dr. Momin talk a little bit broader about the programs that are happening throughout the country. Thank you so much for that question. Um, the American Liver Foundation covers so many different liver diseases and hepatitis B is on our list as a focus, especially on the upcoming five years with our new Think Liver Think Life campaign, which I'll be talking about during our closing. And we have in the last year partnered with the Hepatitis B Foundation, which we are extremely excited about. We hosted a round table earlier this spring um, in regards to hepatitis D, and we're gonna be following it up throughout the next couple of years with other programming. We have also done over the last couple of years, programming specific to hepatitis B, not as much as we would like to, and that's why we're gonna be um, going forward and figuring out which particular areas that we need to do more programming with. Um, and so a question like that is great. And, and for other patients and others to, to email us and reach out to us to let us know, what would you like to see? What would you like to learn more about and how we can do more in regards to hepatitis B in the community? But we're hopeful that our new five-year campaign, Think Liver, Think Life, uh, will be able to cover a piece of that uh, over the next five years. Thank you. Thank you, Ivory, and, and thank you to the American Liver Foundation for all the work that you are doing. I, I will just add by saying that I think the CDC, and I mentioned this in my talk, that um, this year we the, the, the CDC has updated their guidelines in terms of hepatitis B vaccination. So however we can collaborate, Ivory, with the American Liver Foundation, um, bringing in our, our uh, researchers to speak about the updated guidelines and what has changed. Uh, in 2020, we've also updated the guidelines for hepatitis C screening. So another opportunity for us to also collaborate with you to disseminate the new guidelines, and we're happy to do that. And I think it's also a reminder to the patients who are on the call that the American Liver Foundation has many opportunities for volunteering. And by being on this call today, you're learning so much about liver disease, liver cancer, and so engaging your communities in the fight against liver disease, think liver, think life, would be very helpful. So we are really grateful that everyone is here today. Um, changing a little bit the topic to talk about clinical trials. Um, one thing that came up was what are or are there clinical trials for patients after liver transplant who may have recurrence? So Dr. Dinasakaran, do you want to maybe say if there are some opportunities for people in this, this area? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. I think I, I briefly mentioned that there are studies going on in this space. Um, so after, if you're diagnosed with early stage, um, early enough to undergo surgery, uh, for the removing just the tumor, which, is, which we call resection, or a transplant where the entire liver is removed and you get a new liver. Or sometimes it's called an ablation where we put a needle and just sort of burn the tumor. The idea with these kind of therapies is that we should achieve cure, that all the cancer cells should be dead and now you should be cancer free. Um, but liver cancer is, is pretty high risk for recurrence. So the tumor can come back in the new liver or in the remaining liver if you just remove part of the liver. And this is a big challenge. And a lot of my patients, I'm scanning them every three to six months. And it is, uh, you know, so much anxiety and so much, um, you know, worry as they wait to hear the news, did the cancer come back? And you just want to live in peace and forget about this thing, right? Um, in the past, adjuvant therapies, as in you got the main treatment and now you don't have cancer. So now you need to get another treatment to prevent the cancer from coming back. We would call that adjuvant. Many were tried and failed in clinical trials. So currently, uh, we don't use anything as a standard of care. But with the new drugs that have come up in the last five years, there's a lot of promise that uh, they're so safe and effective that they should be, we should be able to use them in this setting to prevent new tumors from coming back, especially after things like resection and ablation. We think immunotherapy is going to be a great tool in this setting to kill those remaining cells that are likely in circulation or in the bone marrow or hiding somewhere in the body. Um, transplant is a little more tricky because we are trying to suppress the immune system to prevent you from rejecting your new liver. And then if we give something that revs up the immune system, you know, there's a lot of challenges there. But drugs like targeted therapy, like lenvatinib, those are being tested to see 
uh, if they can work in preventing the cancer coming back, especially um, I think a previous speaker spoke about the retrieve score, Dr. Rai. So when we use some scores, we know which patients are at high risk. So those patients can selectively be uh, tried on these newer, newer drugs or targeted therapies. So there's work going on and there's a lot of promise that we soon have some adjuvant therapies to prevent recurrence. Thank you. And Dr. Gretton, you gave us such a great outline of all the opportunities for treating liver cancer. And uh, there's a question that says, can we talk a little bit more about T-cell clinical th therapy trials that might be available? Yeah, certainly. So th there's plenty of T-cell therapy trials um, actually available. And, you know, um, and I'm happy to say that because, uh, you know, I've been doing this long enough and I remember there were no trials available for patients with HCC. And now it's actually more the other way around that investigators are trying to find patients for the trials because we have so many options. T-cell targeted therapies are open now in all different types of settings. There are studies that test drugs, these what we call immune checkpoint inhibitors, anti-PD-1, PDL1, et cetera, in patients prior to surgery, for instance. So that's the first part. Patients get this treatment prior to surgery, undergo surgery, and then potentially afterwards. There are clinical trials available for patients that underwent surgery or radiofrequency ablation. And then we see, are these immune checkpoint inhibitors able to reduce the recurrence? There is immune checkpoint inhibitor clinical trials available for patients that receive TACE, transarterial chemoembolization. And then there is various T-cell targeting drugs available for patients that have advanced or metastatic disease. Excellent. Excellent. Um, there were lots of comments about how uh, there was appreciation for the talk today, but those are the, the questions that were, were um, entered into the chat. And I think it's just a, a moment to reflect on the fact that we have speakers from the Centers of Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health, leading academic organizations like Stanford, and all these speakers have come to help educate patients and caregivers about liver disease, but also to work together to find ways to prevent liver disease, to treat liver cancer. And I think one of the main messages we've heard throughout all the talks is that there's a lot of hope and a lot of progress forward. Um, and so I wanted to thank everyone for joining today. Um, we, there's a question about the agenda for tomorrow. So maybe we could get that into the chat for people. Uh, and I'll turn it back to Ivory Allison. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Also much. Uh, in regards to the agenda, we will share it out. We will send, um, we will post it on our website as well as post in our Facebook support group. Uh, hopefully you are all a member and you will be able to see that. Um, so we will put that on for tomorrow. Our program will begin at 11 a.m. and an email will be going out in regard to remind everyone. And in that we'll have the Zoom link um, and we hope to see you all again tomorrow. But we quickly wanted to go over a few things. Um, we want you to check out our new website layout at liverfoundation.org for additional resources, including our upcoming events and programs. Additionally, our national helpline is open daily from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. And you can always call our helpline at 1-800-GO-LIVER. A couple of our upcoming programs that you might find helpful. Ask the experts, acute and chronic liver failure. We will also be having a webinar on living well with liver disease. And ask the experts in November 17th, caregivers and mental health, which will be, um, which will be very insightful and informative. And then in December, ask the experts why a clinical trial might be right for you. And we've heard a lot about clinical trials today. Um, and if you are a liver cancer patient or caregiver with firsthand experience with Derva and Treme therapy, and you are willing to share your valuable story via phone, the patient's perspective will help to inform the patient input submission and provide the expert committees in Canada with this valuable insight as they prepare to issue their funding recommendation for this therapy in Canada. So please contact 1-833-792-2726, extension 1000, to sign up and for more information. Also, the information I just mentioned will be shared in our Liver Cancer Facebook group this afternoon. 
That number one more time is 1-833-792-2726, extension 1000. As I mentioned about our Think Liver, Think Life campaign, we're so excited about is our new national five-year public health campaign, which aims to ensure every American understands their risk for liver disease, receives the appropriate diagnostic testing and care coordination, and feels well-informed and supported throughout their liver journey. Focusing first on fatty liver disease and liver cancer, the campaign launches in 10 states with liver health awareness and education events. Go to our website, liverfoundation.org, for our specially created website for Think Liver, Think Life, thinkliverthinklife.org, to see if we will be in your state this year and sign up for any of the programs happening. Again, that is thinkliverthinklife.org. And I just wanted to quickly say, oh my, I feel like this was a great first day. Wow, so much information from all of our presenters. I wanna thank you to all of our speakers and doctors for, for spending this time educating us about liver cancer and providing such valuable and informative information. I know I learned so much and I hope our audience has as well. Special thank you to our planning committee for their commitment and dedication to this conference and liver patients. They, truly put this conference together with all the topics and the speakers, which is so valuable. Thank you again to our sponsors for supporting this event. And thank you to our program logistics manager, who you did not see, uh, Erica, for all of her hard work and coordination for this event. And finally, a big thank you to all of you, our attendees, for joining us on the first day of our third annual liver cancer conference and educate a patient. We hope you found the information helpful and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And we will go out with our final video for, from one of our sponsors. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem. Hopefully the solution to that problem may lead to a drug from everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do, but Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front and good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market? Again, thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you all tomorrow, where we will have a few other sessions, including a cooking demo, and we will hear from um, a patient and a couple of caregivers. Thank you all.